My mum was in the Air Force for 23 years, and this is what she told me. She was a medic and worked in hospitals, and worked at Landstuhl Regional Medical Center in Germany in the 90s. And she said there were a few areas of the hospital that had seen countless numbers of veteran patients and deaths where the faculty got really unwelcome vibes from, or where they'd see shadows or hear voices and footsteps. But this one time, she was in a certain wing of the hospital where she frequently worked, and she needed to go to the fourth floor. And she did so with a fellow airman, since it was required that they travel in pairs. The buddy system. So they walked into the elevator, pressed four, and oddly enough, the elevator went past four, then came back down and kept going up and down without ever opening the doors. Then when it finally opened on four, they looked out into the open doors and saw a floor of the hospital that was completely unfamiliar. Now my mum knew this area inside and out, but said that it was a floor she had never seen before. It even looked like it could have been from a different period of time. It was completely empty. Her and her teammate didn't say anything or make a move to step out. I think they both felt that was wrong. Then the doors closed. The elevator skipped around a few more times and then she came back to floor four and it was completely back to normal, the way they knew it to be. Her teammate said, what just happened? She replied with, I don't know. And they never spoke of it to each other again. I was cleaning a bar in the middle of the night. This is an old building over a hundred years old and over 90 when I worked there. The building was a restaurant slash bar and then became a cafe slash speakeasy during prohibition and there are remnants of tunnels in the basement from bootlegging. As I was cleaning in the middle of the night and being the only one there, I came around a corner to two men playing pool in the pool room on the other side of the hallway. I knew they weren't really there, but they were there even after I squeezed my eyes shut. They were both in old western wear, jeans, hats, one blue, one red plaid. Their movements were fluid, smooth and floaty, almost slow, but not as how they played on the empty table. I wasn't scared, I didn't feel cold or threatened, more curious than disbelief. Hello, can I help you? I said as loudly as I could and started walking quickly towards them, almost at a charge. The one in plaid looked right at me as soon as I crossed the threshold into the room, and they vanished. My name is Yvonne. I'm a female in my 50s. I'm five foot six, a bit on the heavy side, and have limited use of my hands, but hide it well. Presently living in the state of Arizona, and throughout the years have encountered many creepers, and due to my friendly demeanor, I seem to attract them like a magnet. I can make small talk with just about anyone. I show no fear and I walk with confidence. For these same reasons, I'm not afraid to tell anyone phrases such as, please back away, you're making me uncomfortable. And I'm not interested. You've been warned, but my favorite phrase is, don't come any closer because I'm armed. I could say that I have trained myself for any kind of encounter. Every month I drive across town to visit my clinic doctor as I must receive a much needed medication. And my last visit was scheduled for mid morning, which is when the clinic's lobby is at full capacity. I arrived and parked in the front of the clinic, which is a one level building with two main entrances facing east. I make it a habit to always do a quick scan of my surroundings before I exit my car. I like to check for any immediate danger before I put myself in a vulnerable position. On my keychain, I carry a whistle, a small knife, a screwdriver, pepper spray, and my panic button, all in miniature size. I'm old and frail, but I'm not going down without a fight. No, I'm not an aggressive person. You might think I'm overly prepared, and maybe I am, but if you've noticed, it's a violent world we live in, and people like me are targets just about anywhere. I noticed that at one of the clinic entrances, there was a man of about six foot four, maybe 300 pounds, with a long, unkempt beard and tobacco-stained moustache. He appeared homeless, and I have nothing against the homeless. We're all human, after all. But I figured if he's standing by one entrance, I would enter through the other to avoid him, at least being 12 feet away from him. 
I began walking towards the door, and this man started to approach me halfway towards the entrance. He then stretched out his hand and said in a southern accent, Name's Jake, little lady. I didn't shake his hand, but did say hello. He went on to say that he'd seen me before, but forgot my name. As he said this, he tried to block my path. I replied, telling him I'd never seen him before, but it was nice to meet him. And, if he could excuse me, because I was late for my appointment. He then quickly added, if I could take him down the street to Circle K. It wasn't a request, it was a command. I don't think so, Jake, I replied. As I began walking away, I heard him grumble in colorful words. He was talking about how I could just walk away from him. She thinks she can just make fun of Jake and walk away. Yes, he was in fact referring to himself in the third person. I pretended not to hear him, but I knew not to let my guard down because this man was on a mission. And that had me shaking inside. The clinic's lobby was packed, and for a moment I felt safe. I signed in and made my way to sit next to an exit door, still on high alert. Then everything happened so quickly. I pulled out my Samsung Galaxy earbuds and set up Spotify to listen to my favorite podcast and put the volume on low. I saw Jake approach me and I felt my heart skip a beat, but I remained cool and collected. Give me your earbuds. I turned off my podcast, put my earbuds away and slowly stood up. At this point, his voice was louder. I said, give me your earbuds. I don't think so. He then took a step closer and by now he was aware that I was armed. I was going to defend myself. I gave this man a last warning, and to both our misfortune, he didn't comply. Jake takes two big steps, and then sprints towards me as if he was a football player and he was going to tackle me. I screamed and prepared for impact. I knew I was no match for this man. I managed to pepper spray him all over the face, causing him to go down. As he was falling, he attempted to drag me to the ground with him, as he's screaming in pain. He begins pulling me away, and as I'm looking for the exit I sat next to, I notice two people coming in and seeing the action. They froze in place, blocking my exit, and they got pepper spray residue. All the people just stood and videotaped the incident. The staff alerted security and contacted the authorities. I wasn't going to be taken down by this monster, so I basically put all 170 pounds on his back. As I was screaming like a maniac, security finally came and handcuffed Jake. Fortunately, I wasn't hurt, but I was rattled and couldn't stop shaking. Afterwards, I went to the bathroom and cried like a child. My heart goes out to people who were not mentally stable, either by choice or by lack of resources. To Jake, if you're listening, you must have thought that I wasn't scared of you, but honestly, you terrified me, and I've had nightmares of you since we met. I don't plan on using the rest of my miniature weapons, but I wouldn't think twice to defend myself. So, Jake, for your own sake, let's not meet. I was working at a random shop as a part-time worker during the night shift, mainly cleaning because there weren't that many customers at night. All the guys at the store would always, day or night, go outside instead of going to the men's toilet, and I never knew why. There was a sign on the men's bathroom that said, Keep Out, spelled with a C. I thought it was a typo. One of the workers who worked one hour of night shift told me that it was supposed to say Creep Out, and it was hung by a customer. I wonder why. So when he left the store, I went to the bathroom. It smelled like someone had died in there, literally. There was a fresh cheeseburger on the floor and a two-day-old drink. I was confused, but I heard someone into the store, so I sold them what they needed and went back. The door was closed, even though I left it open. I went in and the cheeseburger had two bites in it and the drink was spilled everywhere. There was no one in the stores or anything. I left the place and left a sign on the door for the morning shift and I wrote this. I closed early because I was afraid there's something in the men's bathroom. Bring it a new drink if you don't believe me. I worked the morning shift after that and told them everything. We put up cameras and did everything we could, but there was no sign of anyone. They believed me, but we didn't know what was happening. I told the owner of the shop, and she said this. 
Josh, darling, we haven't had the men's bathroom for 12 years now. That's why everyone goes outside. The place for the men's bathroom is a place for leftover food. Are you okay? I was confused, and me and the morning shift guy went to check. The owner was correct, but who ate the burger if there's no other entrance to the place for leftovers? And the usually locked door. I stopped working there, but was kept informed of the situation. The rest of the information was handed to me from Ben. He said that there was someone or something in the vents of the so-called men's bathroom, but he never did tell me if there was anything after that. I went to the place way later, and it was in ruins. Only two dogs, dead, crushed by the bricks. I never heard from anyone else there again. In the summer of 95, I was a 21-year-old female staying in the one-bedroom dorm in my college that was kept open for the summer. It was a woman's college tucked away between two busy urban areas, and we always felt safe on campus. With the sort of energy that makes me feel tired just thinking of it these days, I would walk a mile and a half to work, a split shift as a waitress, and walk back to the dorm and shower and then head out to meet friends at our local dive bar and drinks and mischief. My friends were always more about the mischief than I was, since I had a long distance boyfriend who I was doing a decently good job of remaining faithful to. It was pretty common for a couple of people to peel off from the group and make their way to whatever hookup they were interested in for the night. But we were all being a little more careful right around the time of this story. I looked for confirmation but couldn't find any news stories. And I know for a fact, though, that there was a serial rapist roaming around the area where we lived and worked and played. No one had a very good description, and people were kind of on edge, making sure no one walked home by themselves at night. 2am was the last call when you're a certain type of friendly girl, specifically taken, a challenge. The bartenders all fall over themselves to lock you in with them and give you one last drink before you go home. It's not ego, it's just how it was. The night in question, it was just my best friend and I hanging out, drinking hideous things like Soko and OJ and Captain Morgan's and Diet Coke. Sweet drinks, easy to sip, and easier to chug until your good sense filters away. My friend Bridget made me promise to let the bartender take her home. She was wandering off with her latest conquest, but I guess still coherent enough to remember that friends didn't make friends walk home at 2.30 a.m. by themselves. I said, yeah, sure, of course I'd get a ride, mentally crossing my fingers. I wasn't gonna pay back the free drinks, and I certainly wasn't gonna let the nasty bartenders get me alone in a car. She walked away. I had my last drink and let myself out of the bar, waving and saying how I was just fine. It was about 25 minutes to walk. I did it all the time. It was mostly main streets, only a few side roads before turning into the college campus. That was a little dicey there. Now, of course, anyone walking home at night by themselves regularly is going to see a creepy character or two. But I had a secret weapon starting in simplicity itself. Most creepy guys weren't used to being seen, being greeted and smiled at. Trust me, I'm not justifying their creepiness, just saying that it was my instinctive, self-protective gambit. 2.30 a.m. I wasn't even thinking about the weirdo from the news. I wish I could remember what I was thinking, and was probably debating whether to break up with my boyfriend, maybe whether Syria would make me sick on top of drinks, or even just singing in my head. All I know is that it was about four blocks from campus, I had turned onto the darker side streets and was ready to be almost home. That's when I saw a guy about half a block away walking towards me. Tall, sort of solid looking, baseball cap, but something about him made me pretty sure he was even older than the grad students we'd sometimes joke around with. I wasn't really scared, any more than any other night. I just plastered a smile on my face and got ready to chirp out, hi there, what a great night, isn't it? I only got out, hi. I was still smiling when he sort of paused. Thinking back, it all happened so fast, I don't have a good feel for the timing of the whole thing. I just know I said hello. He paused and sort of tilted his head and looked at me. I don't remember what he looked like other than the dark hair. 
It wasn't much in the way of ambient light, and the street lights were pretty far apart around that area. He nodded slowly. I remember slowing down, thinking he was going to say something to me, and would have to react nicely. I was irritated, but I must have kept a smile on my face, because he said pretty quietly in an extremely gravelly voice, You should go home now. You're a nice girl. A nice girl shouldn't be out. I'll never forget the way he said that. The tone in his voice, and the precision of his word choice. I made a note to tell Bridget, Crap, I met another weirdo. I picked up the pace though, calling out, Have a great night, as I rounded the bend and saw the entrance to campus ahead. I walked quicker than normal, not running but definitely upping my pace, and I crashed, slept hard and almost missed my alarm to make it to work the next day. I was no amateur, and totally set my work before I left for the night. I was doing my side work at the restaurant before things picked up, when I saw one of my co-workers stop and stare at the TV set that blared away in the bar. It was drowned out at night when people crowded around 6pm, but it was loud and clear when the news was on. Turns out the night before, the rapist had broken into a house and attacked another woman. I'll spare you the details, they're pretty awful. I just wish the lady hadn't been having trouble sleeping. She kept staring at the digital alarm clock, playing games with the number, she said. If she kept her eyes open and saw the number flick, she'd fall asleep. Stupid games like that. I mean, she knew exactly what time someone walked into a room. Turns out it was about 10 minutes later and a street over from where I saw the guy and trusted my stupid trick to keep me safe. She didn't see his face, but she talked about how his voice sounded like someone who'd been screaming all night all hoarse and guttural. I still shiver at my close escape, and I still smile at strangers and say hi, but I don't walk at night anymore. It might not be as scary as some of the paranormal stuff everyone's seen, but it turns out I probably saw the face of evil, and it was dark enough that I barely saw anything at all. They never caught the guy. I don't even remember how it ended, just that it seemed to trail off once the school year started again. I've been working armed security for nearly a decade now, but I still remember working unarmed when I started out in my early 20s. I worked my way to a trusted position with my agency, where at 22 years old, I was assigned to the Colorado Springs Deaf and Blind School. At the time, only senior, more experienced officers were permitted to work there at all but I was given the 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. shifts, Monday night through Saturday morning. A little backstory on the deaf and blind school. It was opened in the early 1870s and was where the burden children of the state were sent to learn and live, but many were put to work there as laborers working fields or manufacturing items. Because of a number of ailments, accidents, or pre-existing health conditions, a large number of children and staff passed while there to where, in the early 1880s, a small cemetery was created and formed at the intersection of Pikes Peak Avenue and Institute Street. Growing up in Colorado Springs, I was always told ghost stories about the flesh-eating bacteria on stuffed taxidermied animals, ghosts walking in buildings, and the haunted service tunnels below the school connecting to the old train depot. But I never really believed it. Fast forward to my third month posted there. Two nights before my 21st birthday, and a full week before students returned for the fall semester for our actual special needs schooling. And I had my first encounter in the gym, while checking the boys' locker rooms. A solid black figure ran past the showers. I rushed to find the intruder, not knowing what I would have done to it when I found it, as I was completely unarmed except for a flashlight. After clearing the building twice and checking all the doors multiple times, I took it as my imagination. The night of my birthday is when everything got much weirder. The shift change went as normal, and everything was fine up until 2.30 a.m. Property and building check-ins. When I went into the carriage house top floor, 
were the school stores, all the spare desks and modern school equipment. It appeared that a person was standing in the back corner near the older stairs. I shouted at the figure and began to charge towards him. In a frenzy, I hurried to cut him off at the first floor door, but when I got to the door, it was still locked with the interior bolt. I searched the first floor when I found the doors to the service tunnel open. On my first day, I was told not to enter into the tunnels alone, as they expanded for miles in a labyrinth. And before I went in, I didn't contact a supervisor. I felt as if I had walked for hours, but only a few minutes, which is when I hear in a very soft voice, almost childlike, Happy birthday, Mr. Officer. The next thing I knew, my very angry supervisor, the school's maintenance director, and two CSPD officers were shaking me by the shoulders. My supervisor then informed me I missed my 3 a.m. check-in and was sitting in a corner of the tunnels in the dark for over three hours. We all left the tunnels and carriage house to see that the sun was beginning to rise. Later that day, my boss reassigned me to a different location after I was cleared from a doctor to work. I don't fully know what I saw or what was in those buildings but it still gives me the chills. And I'll never forget the voice that made me black out for so long. Happy birthday, Mr. Officer. My father moved to Manhattan from Peru in 1970. One night during this time period, he was out at a bar with his friend Carlos, also from Peru. Sometime during the night, they were approached by a well-spoken, friendly, nicely dressed American man. He offered to buy them around, and they spent a few hours drinking and talking. After a while, the man invited them back to his apartment somewhere on the Upper East Side to keep drinking and hanging out. My father instantly and instinctively was not into this idea. But Carlos, drunk and chasing more free drinks, stupidly insisted they take him up on it. They arrive at the apartment, and after an hour or so, Carlos had passed out sitting up in the man's reclining chair. Everything had been fine, but my dad was never comfortable with the idea, and now knew it'd be even more complicated with Carlos passed out. He went to the bathroom for a minute to splash some water on his face and sober himself up. When he stepped inside, he immediately noticed a large pair of scissors in the sink. They were way larger than any normal household pair, and he compared them to something you might see in a hospital. He told me at that moment his entire body was overtaken with instinct, and something inside him made him pick up the scissors and put them in the waist of his pants behind his back. When he walked out to the living room, he found the man with his hand on Carlos's leg. He asked him what he was doing and said they were leaving now. The man told him to just relax and keep drinking, but enough was enough and my father was insistent. At this point, he said the man's face dropped, his voice lowered and his whole demeanor changed. You're not going anywhere, was the man's reply, as he produced a large pocket knife from a pocket of his own. Upon this, my father pulled the scissors from behind his back and locked eyes with the man. They stood tensely for a moment, as my father explained in less words, I've got scissors and you've got a knife. If you come for me, I'm getting you too. The man realizing the stalemate put the knife down and said, get out. My dad shook Carlos awake, practically carrying him from his feet and pushed him out the door, never taking his eyes off the man or his hand off the scissors. He said the man stood at the door and glared at them as they backed down the hallway to the elevator. So possible murderer and God knows what else in 1970s Manhattan. Let's not meet. I used to bartend and one of my Friday night duties was closing down the restaurant and counting the money, which meant I was often left alone in the building. I would usually turn off half the light and leave enough on so that I could see. On this particular night, I did the usual closing stuff and was walking through the kitchen to the office where I would count the money. 
Right by the office, there is a door that leads to the dining area. When out of the corner of my eye, I swear I saw an older man sitting in a section of the restaurant that we refer to as the Twenties. When I looked, there wasn't anything there. I wasn't scared, but I went about my business. I opened the restaurant the next morning, and the server working with me had worked at the restaurant on and off for a long time. I was talking to her and said, yeah, the strangest thing happened last night. No one was in the restaurant, but then I thought I saw someone. And without skipping a beat, she says, oh yeah, the man in the 20 section, he likes hanging out there. The fact she knew it was an old man in the section of the restaurant without me giving specifics, sent chills like you can't imagine down my spine. I used to work for the US Air Force munition system, code 2WOX1. Basically, I was just towing trailers back and forth all night. Well, one night I was alone checking a trailer behind our conventional munition shop before grabbing it and towing it away. The trailer was parked next to the fence and I was on the side opposite the fence. As I moved my flashlight, check the tires, it caught my eyes outside the wire. So I swept the light up and looked up for five minutes, trying to figure out what I'd seen, thinking it was like coyote or something since we were in New Mexico. I figure I must have spooked it, so I turned off my light, finished my hookup and left. The next day I'm talking to a buddy in conventional, and they tell me they found tracks all over behind the fence next to the building, and had to report it to the security forces since there wasn't really a road back there or anything, as it's a secure area. Then the guy, who happened to be a Native American, tells me this story about skinwalkers and how they like to spy on people who are alone and take their souls and stuff. And I did the damnedest to never be alone there again. You know, with a base this size, there's native burial grounds that we bulldozed at some point and definitely pissed something off. This happened around 2002. I moved to Belfast from London, and I would have been about 11. I'm 30 now. I lived in a new area. A lot of houses were being built, and they were all massive and beautiful houses despite being a terrible area, which I thankfully no longer live in. I'm with a friend called Dave. We're looking for my sister, and we go around the corner from my house where they are building a bunch of houses, and it's pretty dark. I'd probably say it's like 10 or 11 p.m. I don't really remember why we were actually looking for my sister. I don't even think she was around. We were walking past houses that looked pretty much finished. We're chatting and a guy randomly shows up out of the blue behind us, grabs a hold of me. Dave, by this stage, is batshit petrified and runs away crying and climbs over a fence. He completely ditches me. The guy is very casual despite being creepy and I'm not as freaked out as I should be. I assume he's a Pruvy, which is someone who watches the streets in West Belfast. He's got a hold of me, and it's like when you've been caught in a place you shouldn't be in. I expect him to just be like, you shouldn't be here at night while we're patrolling the streets. But suddenly we go to a house which isn't completely built yet, and nobody lives in it. I'm standing outside this basement looking house while he's outside phoning the cops. I assume he's fake calling them. The conversation sounds fake, like he's just trying to scare me. And this is where I really get freaked out now. Because on the upstairs, there's this constant tapping sound. It can't be a builder because it's 11 p.m. It sounds like someone is locked inside something and trying to get out. That scared me. It was the speed of the sound and as if they knew I was in the house. It sounded like they were trapped upstairs or something. Suddenly he's off the phone and he's like, okay, the cops are coming to your house soon, leave now. And I'm thinking, nah, not really. I didn't give you my address. But at the same time I was freaking out because maybe this guy knows the streets and where I live. So that entire night, I was just looking out my window hoping no cops would come by and they didn't in the end. And he obviously did all that just to scare me. But why? The situation for me is frightening because a random guy grabbing a hold of you in the street in the pitch darkness is freaky, regardless or not whether it's a building site, despite the fact I probably shouldn't have been there. He could have put me in a room and locked the door, had someone torture me or something. I've always wondered, like, why he was there, what he was doing. Afterwards, I was scared to go out at night in the area. 
unless I had someone accompany me. Truth be told, there were a lot of issues in the area, and I'm guessing that guy was like a bunch of other guys that were just acting like undercover police, since they aren't usually comfortable coming to where I live, since they'd usually get bricked. It comes from the troubles. Looking back, though, I think the entrance was blocked off, and we weren't actually allowed there. Considering the situation, I was actually pretty calm compared to my friend, and I have terrible anxiety. I think I just assumed this guy wasn't bad, but again, on any given day, he could have been bad. Really. An acquaintance of mine was guarding a warehouse on a military base in the middle of an empty field. He told me he always had some candy in his pocket for easy access, in case he saw the ghost of a child. Said kid trespassed and was shot in the 1970s or so, and since then all the night watchmen who heard a kid laugh or cry toss candy at their backs, so they can't see the source of the sound. The story about the ghost boy was in the middle of the last military dictatorship of 1976 to 1981 in Argentina. It was not strange to hear about people disappearing, including 500 kids, 15 or younger. That's why lots of people think the kid was not trespassing, but escaping the military base, and his ghost is still there to torment the people who kidnapped and tortured him. Another was a police officer working the night shift in the building, a few years ago, a fire destroyed the building, therefore killing the officer working there. He told me it was not a rare occurrence to hear heavy footsteps, as in someone with police footwear going upstairs to him. But he never saw anything. But since both were colleagues, he wasn't worried at all. This next story happened a few streets away from my parents' house almost 10 years ago. It was all over the news, even national news. A bus driver was at the end of his shift and stopped very close to a cemetery. Only him and an acquaintance were on the bus and the lights were off since it was not taking any more passengers at the time. And both saw a woman in the middle aisle of the bus, young, blonde and in very bad shape and reeking. She had a bag in her hand and went to the driver to show its contents and it was a severed human head. The ghost asked the driver to not break eye contact if this was the end of the route since she had to ride another bus. Both men saw, listened and smelt her. Even when she vanished, both were in shock and unable to do anything for a while. And the driver called his colleague for help. And when they arrived, both the driver and the passenger were in no condition to be left alone. A mechanic had to drive the bus, but had to stop before arriving at the company's garage. The constant ringing of the bell, the one to tell the driver that the next stop is yours, drove him crazy. The GPS stopped working, and the doors opened and closed completely by themselves. It was a very eventful night. I had just recently gotten my first job at a chain sandwich shop. It was located in this shopping mall outlet at the far end. There were quite a few businesses around it, including a restaurant down the way and a super target on the other side of the mall at the far end of the parking lot. My parents were always super protective and taught me at a young age to be aware of my surroundings and protect myself and rarely ever let me walk alone to begin with. On this particular day, I had left my phone at home because I wasn't allowed to have it at work and had a daily time limit on it anyway. Thanks, mum. I ended up finishing up early and my mum was still shopping at the Target, so told me to go ahead and walk over to meet her. I began walking towards the Target and had to wait for passing cars. One silver car stopped and let me walk across. I smiled and waved thank you and the man inside the car did the same and turned on the street going in the direction I was walking. I didn't think anything of it as it was a relatively busy parking lot and most of the shops are over on the other side by the target. A minute or two goes by and I spot the same car now driving in the opposite direction towards me. I take a mental note but think that I'm just overreacting. This is until he turns back round. At this point I'm cornered, and notice I'm now at a part of the mall that's a little less crowded with more of an empty parking lot. I get this uneasy feeling in my stomach that he's following me, and to test my hypothesis, I switch my direction. Instead of heading towards the target, I walk towards the restaurant. The car immediately turns into the parking lot, 
I switch into freak out mode and speed walk to the front doors. In my time of panic, I didn't realize that the parking spot for the restaurant were completely empty. I pull on the doors and they're locked. They were apparently closed on Sundays. At this point, the man in the gray car was parked in the lot in front of the restaurant watching me. The way he was parked, I would have had to pass his car and go back on the path I was originally on. I stand there a moment, pretending not to notice and thinking about what to do next. I obviously didn't want to walk any closer to the car than I already was and decided to cut through the side shrubbery of the restaurant and head towards the closest shop I could find. The gray car comes out of the parking lot still following me and I bolt into the dollar store across from the restaurant. I see the gray car park and I walk up to one of the cashiers and explain what happened and ask if I could use their phone to speak to my mother. She says of course and tells me to stay in here until my mum comes to get me. I call my mum and tell her about the car and she of course freaks out. By this time I think the man in the car caught on because he eventually backs out and leaves. My mum shows up and thanks the cashier lady and we drive to Target. Aside from both of us being shaken up, we were fine. It definitely ruined me walking alone again. But now that I'm an adult and live on my own, I carry pepper spray and a pocket knife everywhere I go just in case and rarely walk anywhere unless I'm with someone or it's only a few minutes away. It still scares me today to think what could have happened or what that man's intentions were. So to the man in the gray car, let's not meet again. I used to volunteer at a religious retreat that was centuries old. And since I lived some distance away, I was given accommodation. I worked the evening shift in the on-site cafe bar and got back to my room shortly after midnight. I opened the door to my room and just as the light came on, I saw a shadow shaped like a cat walk through my ankles and vanish. I had many experiences like this that could only be explained as the paranormal, but this one stuck with me and obviously I never found any cat. I moved into the neighborhood I live in right now, about 15 years ago, when I was nine. The school district in this area is really good and a new elementary school had just opened up at the time. So my parents thought it was a great place to go. This is the general time frame for this encounter. Everything went fine and dandy for the most part. I attended third grade at the school and my sister went to middle school not too far from it. One day though, my sister came home with a note from the school's admin. Apparently there had been increasing reports of child predators in the area. Whether these had been noted via children telling their encounters or terrified parents reporting their missing kids, I was too young to know. The notice was warning parents about it and telling them to caution their children. Naturally hearing this, my rather protective, exceptionally Asian parents sat my sister and I down and nearly gave us the whole shebang when it came to child predators. They told us as much as they could about the awful things a predator would do to us if we ever got caught without having to use the word rape. Suffice to say, she and I got the gist of it. What I remember most clearly about the exchange is the pains that they went through to make sure we would catch on to any of the tricks that potential kidnappers might use on us. They'll ask if you've seen a little dog, my mother said to me. They'll ask you to help them look for it. Even though we were sufficiently spooked, I went to school the next day without thinking too much of it. After all, I didn't think it would ever happen to me. Now, because the elementary school was so entrenched in the neighborhood, it was within short biking distance and I rode there every morning and rode home every evening. And that day was the same. I remember turning the corner of the sidewalk and riding towards the T intersection, the corner of which my house occupied. As I was leisurely biking along, a truck slowly pulled into the street and drove up next to me. I want to say it was a black pickup truck, but I can't remember exactly. What I do recall is slowing down and looking over at it as the window rolled down. A man leaned down. I think he looked young, but as a child, I had a somewhat skewed sense of age judgment. And I remember very clearly that he was Caucasian. He then proceeded to ask, 
Have you seen a little dog? I was so spooked I stared at him wide-eyed for a full moment before biking full speed diagonally across the road to get to my house as fast as I could. I remember glancing back over my shoulder to see him look around before turning into another intersection. What I don't remember is what I told my parents when I got home. The next day at school I got pulled out of class by the principal. She took me into an unoccupied classroom that wasn't being used for lack of people. She asked me all sorts of things about the man. What did he look like? What kind of car was he driving? How old I thought he was? I couldn't give them a very good description because I didn't know much about makes or models of cars. And I was afraid that any concrete details I could give them would just be my brain trying to fill in the gaps. She thanked me and told me that a police report would be filed. I didn't hear anything of it after that, but for a long time I was scared of being out of the neighborhood alone. Five years later, when I was in middle school, I learned that one of the two kindergarten teachers at the elementary school got booked for child molestation. Two years after that, when I was in high school, it was one of the gym teachers, so the area really did have a bit of a problem. At any rate, I never learned what became of my police report. Maybe the man really just was looking for a little dog. Whatever the case, sir, let's not meet again. When I was younger, I had an agency job cleaning buses at the local depot. The pay was abysmal, but it was a chill job where you were left to your own devices most of the time. The fleet was mostly modern, but there were a few ancient double-deckers kept around for less grueling duties. One of those buses in particular was haunted. The other cleaners and I would often hear people walk around on the top deck while cleaning the bottom, and when you were on the top deck, you'd sometimes hear footsteps slowly coming down the stairwell. They would always stop once they hit the top step. Some nights you'd hear the distinctive creaking sound of the destination blind, being cranked from the driver's cabin too, but when you ran down, the blind or its handle wouldn't have moved an inch. One night I was on my knees sweeping up broken glass with a dustpan and brush when I noticed something from the corner of my eye. Behind the seat I was sweeping in front of, I could see a pair of legs. They were as solid as any other pair of legs, and I remember that they were wearing, very clearly, green corduroy trousers, dark socks, and brown brogues. They then began to bend. I was crapping myself and fell back with my eyes firmly closed. Then I dared myself to reopen them. There was nothing there. I finished as quickly as possible and moved on to the next bus. Over a cup of tea, I told the other cleaners I'd seen something weird on that bus. And she just looked at me and went, were they green legs? I never saw those legs again, but apparently she saw them a few times, always just the legs. She never dared to look up and just looked away until they disappeared. I used to work private security at a shopping mall. My partner and I had already had a feeling this place was haunted. One reason being the homicide that happened right before I was hired made it so inclined. The very west of the mall made the hair on my neck stand on end the most, and I don't know why. It's also very good to note there is minimal shelter at this end of the mall. You can see the cats and dogs walking through the windows at night, and they would bark and whine a lot. One night, I was walking to that end of the mall, and I started to feel like something was following me or walking behind me. When I got to the shelter, none of the animals were making a noise, but I swear to God, all of them were awake and staring at or behind me. I got really bad goosebumps and a horrible feeling once in my gut. I put my head down and walked out as fast as possible and closed the door. Once outside, all the negative feelings just went away. I was in Navy boot camp in Orlando. I was alone on watch in our company's barracks compartment. I was checking all of the windows because the CC liked to unlock one or two to make sure we checked them all. That put me between the racks or bunk beds on the wall. 
I caught movement down the middle open area of the compartment. A flash of white. White shoes meant brand new recruits. We had been there long enough to know we were wearing our black Oxfords. I went between the racks to the middle so that I could see who had come into the compartment. The outside door definitely hadn't opened, and I would have heard the door by the inside stairwell. The door to the laundry area was locked. Standing across the open area, by the other row of racks was a girl with dark curly hair, wearing the same female utilities as me, light blue shirt, black pants, and was wearing the white tennis shoes, which meant she'd been there only a few weeks. She looked at me and then she wasn't there. No place for her to go. We were in the middle of the compartment, yards from the door, and nowhere to hide. I didn't see her move. She was just there one moment and the next, gone. Only saw her for a heartbeat or two. Spookier still, years later, someone was telling us about doing roving patrol watch at boot camp and how they kept finding a pair of white sneakers in the locked laundry room of an empty compartment. It freaked her out. They said that they would then put the shoes outside on the breezeway, then lock the door, but the shoes would be thumping in the dryer when they came back around. She said the red lights always looked darker in there. They'd do their checks and leave as fast as they could. They thought one of the CCs was playing a joke with the shoes. I asked which building, which wing, which floor, and it was my old compartment, exactly the same place I had seen that girl. I'd recently gone back to my home state for a visit, after roughly a year and a half away. I caught up with a few friends on my first night and shot the breeze of dinner and billiards. I come to find my friend Tony has changed his mind about attending community college and decided to try his hand at pursuing a childhood dream instead. He didn't really get into much detail at the time. As a matter of fact, the conversation started towards the end of the night. I made it a point to mention that I needed to go and rent a hotel room. Tony wasn't having it. Nope. I'd be a pretty crap friend if I let you drive off right now. I'm only three miles away and I converted my old bedroom into an office and guest sleeping area after my brother moved out. Save your cash. Tony and I had been friends since the seventh grade. As a matter of fact, we're still friends to this day. Like me, he was a quiet kid, at least at first. His uncle worked at our old school as a teacher's aide, and I overheard them talking about a mutual interest one day. Classic punk rock. I was doing my best not to eavesdrop, but then they started talking about the damned. I joined in on the conversation, and that's how he became one of my closest friends in the world. So back to the evening at hand, I accepted his offer and followed him back to his house. We must have sat up for another three hours, just reminiscing before I crashed for the night. I got off the following morning, and am greeted by the smell of fresh coffee and blueberry muffins. Tony asks me how I slept, and I told him pretty well and pulled myself a mug of hot bean water life elixir. So do you have plans for today? You mentioned you only have today and tomorrow off work. I look at Tony and sip my coffee. I was thinking of going down to Wildwood or possibly Ocean City. Figured I'd check out the old stomping grounds and see whatever Gateway 26 has to offer. Tony nodded and took a bite of his muffin. Sounds like a plan. You think you could be back this way around five? He said while producing a ticket from his shirt pocket. He handed it to me, and it was for some indie wrestling show at Moose Lodge. I eyed down the piece of paper and thought about it for a minute. Sure, could be fun. I folded the ticket up and placed it within my wallet. After finishing breakfast, I wrote down the directions Tony gave me, and then I made my way to the boardwalk. Knowing I would have to be up at his at five, I opted to go to Ocean City. After enjoying some time at the arcades and devouring a few slices of heavenly pizza, I killed some time just meandering and taking in the sights. It was close to half past three when I made my way back to my car and made the journey to Moose Lodge. Upon arriving, I looked all over the place for Tony to no avail. I figured maybe I'd arrived a little too early, so I pulled the ticket out of my wallet and handed it to the lodge employee, tending to the front door. I get inside and begin looking around the crowd. There were perhaps 50 people. I have been to a few of these indie shows, and I can honestly say the crowd turnout has always been relatively small. 
This was one of the smallest. As I'm surveying my surroundings, I see it. The back of a wheelchair absolutely plastered in punk band stickers. In it, an older gentleman in his late 40s or early 50s, with bleach, blonde, Billy Idol hair and a leather jacket, loaded with pyramid studs and punks not dead, airbrushed on the back. Uncle Frank! I yell at the top of my lungs. The man in the wheelchair looks at me and shoots me an ear-to-ear -ear grin. Get your butt over here and give your uncle a hug. When you're done, cop and squat right here. He pointed to the chair on his left. I made my way over to Frank and he gave me a hug so tight he damn near dropped my back. I took my seat and asked him if he'd seen Tony. He said he was around here somewhere and that he thought he'd gone to grab some cheesesteaks from the concession. As if the timing couldn't be any more perfect, Tony sat down at the chair to the right of his uncle and handed me the thing I planned to make my dinner later on tonight. We sat there watching some good independent talent shows. Lots of flippy stuff on the ropes, tons of crowd interaction. They really wanted to make sure the crowd got their money's worth. When the show was approaching its second hour, it happened. Now I don't remember the wrestler's name. I could tell you he looked like King Kong Bundy with a mullet. He stood roughly six foot tall, and he was well over 300 pounds, an absolute mountain of a man. His opponent was some kid that was maybe 21 years old and looked like he weighed 170 pounds soaking wet. The mountain man threw him around the ring like a training dummy and proceeded to beat the ever-loving living hell out of him throughout the insanely short match before leveling him with what looked like a rock bottom from the second rope. One, two, three, the match was over. Obviously this man was playing the part of the heel and boy was he getting into it. He climbed out of the ring and proceeded to talk smack to the crowd even getting a few people's faces. But when he got to Tony, the mood completely changed. Things stopped being entertaining. Now, if you'll humor me for a moment, let me just say I stand at five foot nine, and at the time I weighed 180 pounds. I'm not a big guy, never have been, and certainly don't look my age. This was probably my one and only saving grace. This guy gets in Tony's face, and he shot the big guy a look back before telling him to go piss off. Big guy takes offense slapped Tony's disposable cup of Dr. Pepper out of his hand, splashing it all over his uncle in the process. Tony goes over the makeshift guardrail. He then rips off Tony's shirt and starts and start lighting up his chest and back with open-handed overhand chops. Everything's in slow motion at this point, and I get the bright idea to hop the guardrail and punch this guy in the back of the head. Everything went quiet and I zeroed in on his expression on his face as he turned his attention to me. This is how I die, was the most prevalent thought in my head at the time. Before anything could happen, I felt two hands go under my armpits and grasp my shoulders. Security began dragging me out. As I looked down towards Tony and Frank, they were yelling something I couldn't make out. The security guard looked at me and told me point blank I was lucky. I was a kid, otherwise he would have let the wrestler get a few good shots on me. I told the guard I would stay outside my car, but I wanted to make sure my friends were okay. They told me that would be fine as I waited and waited and waited. People began making their way to their cars and driving off as the show was over. I was looking all around for Tony, but didn't see him. Finally, I see Frank wheeling his way through the door with a look on his face. I couldn't quite pinpoint what it was supposed to mean. It was something between bewilderment and fighting the urge to laugh. Well. You know how to melt this old New York punk's heart. You got your ass kicked out there trying to take on the equivalent of human Godzilla. I'd say you have a death wish, but I know why you did it. Proud of you, man. Frank patted me on the arm, and I asked him where his nephew was. Tony's fine. He hit his head. He should be out any minute. I nodded at Frank and watched his expression change to one of horror. As I turn around, I see the wrestler I donkey punched. His GMC Jimmy was parked next to my car. He grabbed me by the jacket and pushed me against his vehicle while winding me up to give me a receipt. At this point, I closed my eyes and accepted. Much like a fly hitting a windshield, the last thing to go through my mind was going to be my ass, as this man punched it through my colon. I braced myself for impact, and then it happened. 
it was like a raindrop hitting me in the face. I opened my eyes to see Tony standing next to this shaven Sasquatch, and they're both busting a gut. That's how you throw a worked punch. And he lets go of my jacket and brushes me off. Tony then explained to me he had been there since two, working with the large man. I now know as Mike. They planned out the whole thing. Mike was Tony's trainer, and this evening was supposed to be a storyline beating that would lead to Tony's first ring-in match in about a month's time, for those of you keeping score. Tony was what is known as a plant in the sports entertainment, and yet he forgot to tell me this whole ordeal would happen. Maybe he was just trying to help sell the moment. Maybe he genuinely forgot, but I honestly can't say. That was one of my brightest moments. Tony followed his childhood dream for a little while. I'd like to say about four years, but unfortunately, indie wrestling shows don't really pay the bills and they take a huge toll on your body. Today, he works as a 911 dispatcher. Occasionally, we talk about his wrestling days and glance over it every now and again. Mike, you human horror movie with a weird sense of humor. Should we ever meet again, I honestly hope you buy me a drink after all that. And thank you for not turning my innards into outards. Just dumb kid stuff, right? I worked at Best Buy, stocking shelves a few years ago during the holidays. Only two of us in the whole place. No biggie, I'm listening to podcasts and music every night. As I'm stocking the shelves, I see the most clear possible movement from the corner of my eye that's possible. I would have easily staked a million dollars, had I had them, that a camera would have just caught someone jogging by. I'm creeped out because the other guy is in the back, and as I turn to check that he is, I catch the movement again on the other side of me. And when I say I sprinted to the back, I mean I moved like Usain Bolt towards a gold medal. We checked videos and of course there was nothing, but that was the night. I knew ghosts were real. Here in South Africa, we're in lockdown right now. I'm meant to travel for work to Santa Barbara, but since we're under lockdown, I can't go anywhere. I'm an entrepreneur with a tech startup, and since I travel mostly, I make use of the Regis co-working space for a hot desk or meeting room. It's quite flexible and there's always coffee and pretty girls coming in and out. But since COVID broke out, I saw Regis as a public or corporate office with many people coming in and out. Therefore, I was now stuck with no office. A buddy of mine told me he had an entire unused area at his house behind some offices. I would be alone and I'd have my own kitchen, lounge, TV and bathroom. But the catch is that I'd have to park on the road. Let me explain the way the road is. It's a wide, steepish road with a massive park and zoo on the left, with three entrances and parking, and houses and businesses on the right. I use this road quite often to go to Florida Road, a popular bar and food district. There's only street lights on the houses and business side, as there was a red line or no parking line on the other side, left and right, and I had to park outside the park. So I parked in the first parking nearest the building I was working at. It wasn't near, but I still had to walk a few meters. This story takes place one night before the lockdown. I had a call with a company in Denver, Colorado, which I had to start at 6 p.m. South African Standard Time. It went well, and I decided to pack up and leave. I wore formal shoes and carried my laptop in my bag. Being paranoid before I left, I looked on the CCTV before opening the gate and couldn't see anyone outside. I then proceeded to buzz myself out, locked up, and walked out. I don't know how, but in the time it took me to walk from the building to the gate, a man appeared. He seemed drunk or high, and was just hanging around against the fence on the side of the road my car was on, wearing a hooded sweatshirt with the hoodie down, torn brownish jeans and sneakers, and I started walking and looking down, keeping track of him from the corner of my eye. Mine was the only car left, so I would assume he knew that was mine. As I got closer to my car, I noticed him starting to walk out towards me, but I ignored him. He was still walking diagonally, trying to cut me off. He then said, as he was maybe five meters away, let me help you with your bag. Now, I had a comfortable laptop backpack on, and I was walking hands-free. 
and yet he asked me to help him with my bag. In South Africa, car guards usually help you with your grocery bags and expect a little tip, but not this guy. This guy knew what I was doing and where I was going and what I was carrying. To make matters worse, he had his left hand in his hoodie pocket and was walking fast. It all went down in a split second. He suddenly lunged at me, but being a football player, I feigned left and went right. In that split second, I thought, if I ran to my car, which was still another 10 to 15 meters away, I would have surely not made it. I'm fast, but fumbling with keys, opening the door, getting in, I didn't seem confident. So I made the decision of jumping the fence into the now dark park. I made it over in one leap, albeit slightly slower, since my laptop backpack kept bouncing on my back. As soon as I hit the ground, I took my laptop bag off, held it in my hand and ran, and looked for a dark spot to hide, and ended up behind a massive tree in the park. There are a few of them, but it was the only one that didn't have a light directly hitting it. I heard him running in slurring words and saying something like, Just give me the bag. So my car was on the other side of the tennis courts. If I could get to the tennis courts, sneak around and then run to my car, I would make it. But there was a lit open space between this tree and the tennis court, and he was running straight through the space, and I watched the angle of him running, and slowly rounded the tree to keep myself out of his line of sight. I honestly think him being high helped immensely here, as he ran straight past and towards the other side of the park. When he was a good distance away, which couldn't have been more than 20 meters, I made a break for it. Not being quiet now, I pushed away every branch and leaf which he heard and turned around and saw. I burst around the tennis courts, which was stupid because I could have just came back the way I came, and turned around and saw him yelling and running back at me. He stumbled every now and then, but was picking up the pace and actually gaining on me. I saw it. He had a knife, and it was out now. I puffed my way up the hill, opened the car, jumped in, locked the door with my laptop on my lap and started the car. When I looked back in the darkness, he was gone. He must have slunk him back into the park when I was out of range. But where? I didn't wait to find out. I skidded and drove the hell out of there. I won't say that I won't work there again. I would. But maybe I'll Uber next time. I worked in a group home for kids under the age of five. It was Christmas day and I worked the night shift. There was only one toddler in the house overnights as the rest of the kids went home to visit with their parents. I was the one staff on shift as that's all that was needed for an overnight with one child in the home. The home had lots of ghost stories associated with it. I had experienced a few creepy incidences, but this one became my most memorable and most shared ghost story of the house. I arrived on night shift before midnight, completed shift change with the other staff, and they went home. I did my cleaning and food prep and decided to put on a movie. I did a beg check when I first got there and in the middle of gathering the laundry from the rooms upstairs, where I saw the one toddler sleeping away in his crib. While I was watching the movie, I heard a loud bang from upstairs. My worst fear was that the toddler somehow got out of his crib and fell. I was getting up to check on him, and I heard something running across the floor above me, loud enough that it sounded like a small child, or so I thought. Oh no, he's out of his crib and he's going to hurt himself running around in the dark. So I ran up the stairs two at a time and busted into his room, only to find him sleeping soundly in his crib. I was terrified and put on a pot of black coffee and jittered the whole night away until the kiddo woke up at 6am. The rest of the bed checks that night were very quick and I made sure all lights were turned on at all times when necessary. I worked as a security guard at a YMCA as an 18-year-old kid. It was a bit of a joke job as the hostel part of the building was being used as an informal social housing, i.e. runoffs from the prisons or vulnerable people. The police would visit around three times a week and take people away who were causing problems, and many were ex-cons or on drugs. 
The rest of the buildings, i.e. gym, exercise hall, small canteen, was all closed up and the lights turned out at night. My job was to work 8 p.m. to 8 a.m., checking these buildings every few hours and also do a walkthrough of the hostel to check that nothing was up. There had been a spat of suicides just before I got there, and in the previous week, I had been listening to a distraught brother for an hour on the phone as he begged me to check on his sibling who had threatened to kill himself several times. So anyway, I was on my walkthrough on the bottom floor. All the lights were off. Everything was quiet. To access the bottom floor, I needed to take the elevator down to the basement level. It was an old goods elevator, not for public use. I got down, did my walkthrough, and was on the corridor in sight of the elevator when it pinged and opened, even though I was alone and had not called it. It was covered in blood. When I got to it, there was blood all over the glass mirrors, a little well of blood near the control panel and blood over the keys. It looked like someone had been murdered. There was no body or tissue, just blood. Suitably freaked out, I jumped in as quickly as I could and pinged up to the reception level. When I got out, I went straight to the desk and informed them what I had seen. The guy there was pretty unwilling to help, but we agreed we should call the police and an ambulance. And as we were discussing this, a different elevator pinged and opened right in front of us, and a guy who looked like a zombie walked out. His face and head was a big welt of blood, and he was on crutches. He looked very confused and fell right in front of us. Basically, this guy was a very high drug addict who tried to take the stairs up to his room in the hostel, fell over and cut his head right open, got concussed and got onto the wrong elevator, pressed to go up a level, but when he got there, had fallen onto the control panel and sent it back down to the basement where I'd seen it, only after managing somehow to get out of the floor above. He'd been wandering around the place, leaving a trail of blood in his wake, trying to find help. We called an ambulance, and I was severely freaked out. A couple of years ago, I was in a god-awful relationship with a girl whom I know now has borderline personality disorder and is completely immoral. Every morning, I would run a mile from my house to hers and prop my body in the window into her room, then leave when she let me. On one of those return trips, I was running back home in the freezing winter night, on the phone with her. Recently, my family had been showing some serious concern for me, telling me how dangerous the streets were and how many people died. I ignored them because this girl had me wrapped around her finger. So I'm running, it's dark and freezing and my ear is as usual behind a blend of insults and arguing. When I hear someone yell, hey yo, who's that? I stopped and turned and saw someone walking from their driveway, eyeballing me suspiciously. I held my palms in the air as the universal sign for I'm harmless and said, nobody, before resuming my jog home. As I cleared the street, I heard the same man, this time more hostile, come here. I ignored him, figuring he was just gonna mug me, wasting both of our time as I was broke. He kept calling me, pursuing me through several streets until he changed up his yell. Hey, yo. Again, I ignored this, but I stopped because I was out of breath from running in the cold. Then I heard two loud bangs from behind me. I never believed anyone when they said that the world slows down when you're frightened or worked up enough but I found it to be very true immediately. My brain jumped into action as I put together what just happened. I felt a dull sting on my hip and smelled something I only remembered smelling from sparklers or near fireworks. And I screamed and ran at the top of my lungs before desperately sprinting faster than I've ever moved in my entire life for cover. I tripped over some construction debris, but somehow managed to roll on, scramble, and go straight into another sprint as I heard bang after bang erupt from behind me. My phone flew out my hands and down the street at some point. 
I saw a police car and desperately waved my hands and screeched. Yes, as a man, I will admit, I screeched like a little girl at this point, to help me, as loud as my lungs allowed, only to watch them take off after a van that fled the gunshots when I did. I got home and I saw a lion scooped out my hip and realized that I could have died if I had moved an inch differently. I never found out why someone felt the need to empty their gun in an attempt to kill some poor guy in a messed up relationship. But I learned one or two things that night. My grandfather was a pilot in the Turkish Air Force way back, and being part of NATO, they sent them to Canada to attend Air Force Academy. Just to give you some context, he is very uptight and serious, often the reason being a soldier comes into play. He is the reason why I know a lot of astrophysics. He guided me to science and facts his entire life. Rest in peace, Grandpa. Anyway, he told me he and the rest of the school, including the flight instructors, witnessed a UFO hovering above the main building. He says it came too close to the ground and it was basically impossible not to notice. Then, just as baffled as people are, the UFO shot up straight almost instantly. Must be pulling G-force that would have easily killed a human being. I never saw a UFO with my own eyes. Every object I've ever seen in the sky had an easy explanation. Some took longer to realize, but now it comes to me very naturally. I am a little skeptic about the whole aliens visiting Earth thing. But science says it's not impossible. Fermi's paradox can easily be solved. I also spoke with my mother, as it was her father, and she gave me a few more details that I can remember. It was during the winter of 1958, and after the meal, my grandfather didn't like to talk about these things in general. Only after I pushed him hard did he spill more details, but I forgot some of them. Thanks, Mum. I work in a building that's fairly old and has had at least two people die on the grounds, one violently. All of the staff have seen or heard some very weird stuff. The first ghostly incident I experienced was when I was sitting down waiting for the bartender to finish closing out so that we could go home. The bar had a bunch of copper Moscow mule mugs hanging the top of it on nails, which were never actually used. I was just sort of staring into space when I saw a very, very pale and very large hand reach down from the ceiling onto the outside of the bar, reach over and flick one of the cups so it started swinging wildly. The second thing I saw was also in the bar area. We have a little stock room set behind the bar where the bar staff put their purses so it's pretty normal to have a member of staff back there looking at their phone. It was late in the evening and there was only me and the bartender and I was looking for her. I glanced over to the stockroom and really clearly saw the dark shape of a person leaning over the counter, which I assumed was the bartender. I said something to her and then turned around to go somewhere else and promptly ran into her as she was cleaning on the floor. The last things I experienced happened on that same night. I was cleaning the washrooms after we closed, and when I was wiping down the counters, I heard the sound of something heavy slam against the wall behind me, and then slowly slide down. When I turned around, nothing was there, and that was the wall that didn't lie against any other rooms. I was really freaked out, so I finished up cleaning and went back to the bar area, and the bartender asked me to lock the front door. There's a little enclosed alcove that you have to stand in to lock the door, so no one can see you while you're doing it. The second I finished locking, and I turned around from the front door when something slammed right into the door, incredibly hard three times, rattling it like crazy. Other employees have seen weirder stuff, but this is the only thing I ever experienced. I worked as a janitor for a company. We had a contract to clean all the buildings this reality company owned, so they wanted this old ass building carpet cleaned. It was in a decent area and old school part of town. Well, I pulled up and unloaded all my stuff from the van into the doorway. As soon as I got there, I had a really bad feeling, almost like bubble guts. Well, none of the lights are on except the light that they have to keep the place dim, like little lamps and stuff. 
so I'm walking to the back and turn on all the lights, and the switches are right across from the bathrooms. As soon as I turn the lights on, I turn around to see the woman's bathroom door is cracked, and then it slams shut. I froze for a good five minutes, trying not to crap myself, and debated on opening the door to see what was up. Till this day, I still don't know what it was. I just packed up my stuff and got out of there. They never asked about it either, because obviously it didn't get cleaned. I hated working the night shift at the grocery store. I honestly never thought of exploring the store at night. I just stick to the milks and freezer. But one day I had to walk over to the damn meat section to get something with half the lights off. I just remembered the one time, I swear to God, a dude just kept chopping up meat in the dark until I came over to turn the light on. I swear I friggin' ran, knocked stuff over and told my team I was going for a smoke break. That thing slash person for some reason followed me and stood outside smoking, didn't say a thing, and I just ran home that night and called it in. Apparently there was a light in the back that was shining enough for him to work. I didn't buy it though. I got fired. It was better that way. In December of 2013, during my sophomore year of college, my at the time boyfriend, David, had a fraternity dinner banquet that I attended with him. It was a nice event requiring everyone to dress up. He was in a suit, I was in a dress and heels. We had a good time, then went back to his place to drop off the award David won and change into tacky Christmas sweaters for a party we had to attend later that night. It was maybe 7.30 p.m. But given that it was December, it was already dark out when we pulled into the parking lot outside of David's apartment. At his place, there was one road with parking on either side. Spots against the building and spots against a fence that lined the edge of the complex property. We parked in a fence spot, with the trunk of our car facing the building, directly across from the stairs leading up to David's floor. Maybe 30 feet from safety. David and I got out and went to the truck to get his award, when a man started to approach us. David noticed him, and said, What's up, man? The man said nothing, and kept walking towards us. As he got closer, I could see that he was wearing baggy black sweatpants and a camo hoodie. He had the hood on, and the drawstrings were pulled tight, so I could only see about half of his face. Both of his hands were in the front hoodie pocket. David said again, What's up? And this time the man answered, Get up against the car. Wait, what? And then the man pulled a gun from his hoodie pocket. I said, get up against the car. David got up against the back of the car while the man put the gun against his back. I was in utter shock at what was happening. So I took a step back, now trapped between two cars, a fence, and a man holding a gun to my boyfriend. He told David to give him all the money he had. We both really only used cards and never had cash on us. Unfortunately though, while home for Thanksgiving, his parents had given him $200 in 20s, all of which went into the hands of our mugger. Then he turned to me, pointed the gun at my face, and I'm less than a foot away here, and said, your turn. I was dressed up and only carrying a small clutch purse. I literally only had a phone and lip gloss on me. I stammered that I didn't have anything while staring at the gun he had pointed. He then went back to my boyfriend. At this point, I could feel my blood starting to boil. I was becoming less frightened and more pissed off, outraged that this man was aggressively stealing from two broke college kids. How dare he treat other people like this? Couldn't he tell that we were coming from an event and he was going to ruin our night? I wanted to kick him with my big clunky heels so badly, but thankfully I realized that would probably just piss him off. I grabbed my phone, keeping my hands in my purse and tried to dial 911. Unfortunately, my purse was too small to hide any movement and I was just worried that if he saw me trying to call for help, he'd shoot. So I stood there, staring to the gun pressed into David's back. Finally, he took David's wallet and car keys and threw them in one direction, ran off in the other, and hopping the fence separating the apartment complex from a small neighborhood. David and I stood in silence for a second, 
trying to grasp what had just happened. We slowly gathered his keys and wallet, and went inside and called the police, definitely in shock. This is where the story gets really interesting. The police had an officer patrolling on the other side of the apartment complex, as it was a group of 26 buildings and we were in 26. The cop was near one. Because they had gotten the call the previous day about the same guy mugging someone over there, the police and detectives came over and took our story and asked us questions for about an hour. When they left, it was still relatively early, maybe 9 p.m. And we were very shaken. And David and I decided we'd still go to the tacky Christmas party we had planned on attending, thinking that it might take our minds off this horrible encounter. Our friend was hosting a pre-game at his apartment in building three of the same complex. Even though we decided not to drink that night, we headed over after getting into our tacky sweaters. The pre-game got a little rowdy, and we heard a loud knock on the door, and we opened to see the person who lives next to our friend. He said, Hey guys, you might want to keep it down. I don't want anyone getting into trouble. I have police and investigators in my apartment right now because I was mugged out here last night. I heard two more people got mugged tonight, so please be safe. David and I look at each other and then back at him. Oh hi, that was us. We're the two that got mugged. Nice to meet you, fellow mugging victim. He laughed and shook our hands. The neighbor and David compared knives that they were now carrying as personal defense weapons before he went back to his place. Later on down the road, David and I had broken up, but the security at the complex was amped up. More lights were installed in the parking lot, and my girlfriend and I moved in. We had to park in the same set of spots where I was held at gunpoint. Probably a stupid way to face your fears, but we didn't have any other issues while we lived there. To the man who mugged both me and my friend's neighbor, let's not meet again. I'm a 27-year-old male who lives in Eastern Kentucky. I work as the head of security for a chemical company. I signed an NDA, so I can't reveal what the company's name is. But I can say that it's a productions plant and warehouse in the middle of nowhere. And when I say middle of nowhere, I mean at least 10 miles from the nearest town. I always thought it was kind of weird to have security guards at a factory so far from town, but I digress. I usually work with another security guard who was hired within the last year. He's one of those guys who takes his job too seriously. I had been at this position for about five years, and most of my 12-hour shifts consisted of checking video feed, patrolling grounds, sometimes redirecting delivery trucks to the nearest rest stop as we didn't take deliveries at night, and generally slacking off and browsing 4chan and Kiwi farms on company time. The way the factory is laid out is there is a small wing for offices in the front with the employee parking right next to it. Behind that is a break room, which leads out to the production floor, which leads to the two warehouses. One for standard safe chemicals, the other is for flammable chemicals, and outside in the back are four very large silos, which are used to store sort of material. The whole facility, of course, is fenced, with barbed wire for added measure. One night in December of 2020, I was doing my usual routine of slacking off. I was sitting in my office, browsing kiwi farms, and enjoying some dipping tobacco when my company-issued radio went off. Hey Alex, you got anything on the cameras up there? I heard some movement out here in the warehouse. It was the other guard. I looked over towards my monitors and switched to the warehouse camera. I didn't see anything except for the other guard walking around, shining his flashlight. Ah, man, I don't see anything. You're probably just hearing stuff. Probably one of the ventilation units kicking on. Yeah, you're probably right. I don't see anything anyway. I turned my attention away from the monitors and went back to wasting my time, as I still had six hours left on my shift. I began to get bored. So I reached into my backpack to pull out a can of computer duster and got ready to take a fat rip. Right before I could, I heard the motion sensor alarm go off, signifying that there was a truck trying to pull into our receiving dock. I got on the radio 
and asked the other guard to go up to the gate and send the trucker on his way to the rest stop until morning. Roger. I go up to take a dump in the front restroom. Taking only my flashlight with me, I walked out of the office and started down the stairs and started to make my way across the production floor, opening and closing the overhead metal doors to prevent fires from spreading as I went. I shut the last overhead door behind me and was passing the area where all of the forklifts were parked and charging when my radio cracked on. Uh, there isn't a truck out here. You sure the sensor went off? I started to get annoyed, thinking he was messing with me. Yes, it definitely went off. I'm going to use the restroom, so my radio is going to be off for a few minutes. Go ahead and make your rounds in the offices and parking lot, and then walk the fence perimeter and check the silos. I then shut my radio off. I got into the restroom, and while I was doing my business, I heard a loud metallic clang, like something large hitting the floor. I wasn't sure what it could have been, but it startled the hell out of me. I finished up and started back towards my office, turned my radio back on and asked the other guard, did you hear a clang by any chance? Nah, I'm out walking the perimeter right now. Care if I go on break when I'm done? Go ahead, I say. I was going to go ahead and make my rounds anyway. I'll be in the warehouses if you need me. Roger. I walk back up to the office to grab my phone and a clipboard, with an incident report sheet in case anything had actually fallen. I put an earphone in and start listening to some black metal and hear some thunder roar outside. I thought to myself, well, maybe that's the noise I heard. I open the overhead door to the front warehouse and walk inside, then close it behind me. The higher-ups always make a big deal about us just leaving them open, and I always thought it was a waste of time. I'm absentmindedly walking down the corridors of the warehouse, thinking about how badly I need a smoke. I was in the non-flammable warehouse, so figured I could get away with it, as long as the other guard wasn't in the office and checking the camera feed. So I lit up the cigarette and sat down on top of an empty metal drum. I took my earphones out and thought I could hear footsteps. I brushed it off as myself being overworked and too tired for my own good. I finished my cigarette and continued my rounds. Now keep in mind, this is a chemical productions plant, so there are all kinds of chemicals that have very distinct but not pleasant smells in this place, especially in the warehouse. But I caught a whiff that seemed to be out of place. It kind of smelled like sulfur. We don't work with anything that has sulfur in it, as far as I know anyway and once again I brushed it off and kept walking. My earphone battery was dead, so I took it out and put it back in my pocket. I had finished my rounds in the front warehouse and was about to start in the back one, when after a few minutes I made my way out to the silos to make sure the top hatches were still closed and sealed, when my radio went off again. Just the beep you hear before the other person talks. I was waiting to hear the other guard say something, but he didn't. I called back. Everything good? I got no reply. I turned it off and back on, hoping that would fix the issue, but still no dice. When I turned it back on, it began making static noises and wouldn't stop until I turned it off. Only when I took the batteries out did it stop and I once again brushed it off. I made my rounds in the back of the warehouse, uneventfully, and made my way out across the silos. It was pouring with rain at this point so I wanted to get done and back inside as soon as I could. The worst part is that the silos are over 50 feet tall. Luckily, the tops are all connected by a metal catwalk. I climbed up the staircase as quickly as I could, made my check, and started heading down. While I was walking down, my radio started to crackle again. I thought it was weird, since I'd already taken the batteries out. I get back inside and start making my way back to the office, when I hear footsteps. It sounds like someone's running towards me. I point my flashlight in that direction and see the other guard running away. He's as white as a piece of paper, so I tell him to slow down. The hell are you doing, man? Someone's in here, dude! I tried reaching you on the radio, but I couldn't get a hold of you. I didn't believe him, but still I was his boss and still had to hear him out. All right, let's go back to the office. You can tell me what happened, 
and if we have to call the sheriff's department, then we will. He seemed to take comfort in my words, even though I was really just trying to be polite to calm him down. We sat in my office, and he relayed his story. When I was walking back from break, I heard someone call my name from outside the fence. I was confused, so I turned around to see who was calling for me, but no one was there. So I kept walking. I got to the office door and tried to put in the passcode, but it was unresponsive, so I used the manual key to get in. After I went to close the door, I felt something stop it from closing. Like, like if someone put their foot in front of the door. I heard someone call my name again, but no one was there. Then the door slammed shut by itself. By then I figured maybe someone from day shift came in to mess with us, but there are no cars. He got cut off mid-sentence by the receiving doorbell ringing. It had to be rang manually, and is only there so the shipping and receiving guys know when a trucker needs to be let in. It only rings for as long as the button is held down, and it rang close to a whole minute. I switched the camera feed to outside cameras and saw nothing on any monitors, and we have cameras at every door. Screw this, I hear, and I turn around to see the other guards stand up and walk out. I'm out here. I quit. I didn't sign up for this. I was starting to get spooked myself, because I'd never seen anything like this happen before. I didn't bother trying to stop him from leaving. I just told him I'd make sure the gate was open. Haven't seen him since. I figure maybe if I cut the power and turn it back on, the issues will stop coming up. I walk to the plant manager's office and dig around for his extra set of keys. I found them in one of his drawers and head towards the room with all the fuse boxes and breakers in it. I walk into the small room with all of the breakers and fuse boxes and started looking for anything that could have been the master power switch. After looking for a few minutes, I noticed it had gotten considerably colder. It was normally pretty toasty inside the building, but it almost felt like I was standing outside again. I started to really wonder what was going on and just started flipping switches. After hitting one, everything was cut off. The doorbell started going again though, and I hadn't even switched the power back on. The very second before I flipped the switch to turn the power back on, I heard a loud crash. It wasn't coming from inside the building, but that's all I could tell. I flipped the switch and nothing happened. This is where it gets anticlimactic. I started to panic, ran back into my office, locked the doors and figured I'd wait there until the plant manager sent me home in the morning. I sat there for three hours and nothing happened. The manager showed up, asked me what happened and I told him the storm must have knocked the power out and that I had caught the other guard sleeping on duty and he quit when I tried to write him up. Sorry for the anticlimactic ending, but that's all I can disclose. I wonder if the cameras managed to catch anything. If I still worked at that plant, I tried to see what I could find. Before my dad became a state police officer, he did some security work at a big factory. He's not normally a superstitious person, but when he told me this with such a weird seriousness to it, it kind of scared me. He's always said, I don't mess with that stuff, regarding supernatural things. His story was in the early 80s. With working at the factory, he always had the night shift. It was just him, and the factory was big. He had his own little room where he could sit and watch TV, or the radio, relax, or do whatever. Well, the rest of the factory, for the most part besides the exits, were dark, and his job was actually to put the petrol in the factory every hour. He'd grab up his flashlight and just stroll around the place, going down row by row, peeking his head out left and right. One night he said to do his usual run with a flashlight in hand, but he couldn't see that something was unusual to his eye. And when he walked out of the dark, you know the sensation you get when your eyes adjust to the room and you can just make out certain things better? There was something darker in the main hall now, and it was moving. He paused for a minute, and as his eyes fully adjusted, there seemed to be nothing. He took a second swipe with the factory and his light, and then decided that the thing was not worth seeing. He went down to the main row and started his run. Everything was normal, nothing out of the ordinary. Although he was a bit on edge, seeing as the factory without big movements and shadows was creepy enough. When the rows of the factory ended, there was a big open area at this end. 
there was the entrance of a factory. Normally, there would be a dim light at the front, but tonight it had dimmed lower. He thought it was weird and really began to sweat. So instead of investigating any further, he turned from the exit and went back to the main row and got back up to his room. That's when out of the corner of his eye, he saw what he could only describe as a black cloaked figure. His light hit it and he saw it, tall and distinctly human-like, but nonetheless a figure. He just went right back to his own room. He left the factory and called the owner to tell him he wouldn't be returning, and I don't blame him. I was at Camp Leatherneck, Helmand Province, Afghanistan. We were leaving my room, which was a large room with eight other guys, to head to the designated smoking area at around 10 p.m. It was dark and clear. I lit up my cigarette as I was passing through the tea barriers, and when I got back on the other side, I saw about 10 or so marines slash army men looking up at the sky pointing. I looked up and saw three red dots in the sky, about the size of what you'd see on an aeroplane, but far apart in a triangle formation. So one light at each angle point. We're all looking up, and a second set of lights appear, a little to the left of this one. It was super weird, and at one point, the lights from the first set get closer together, then apart again, they completely vanish. To this day, I don't know what it was. It was really cool to witness, though. I'd been with a girl for a few months. We were pretty much inseparable and spent almost all our free time together. Most of said time was spent smoking weed, drinking and popping pills. Enter Sean. Sean is a 100% confirmed rapist who is locally famous for doing said action to a 14 year old girl and getting away with it because it took her too long to get to the police. The guy was inherently mentally unstable and had a ridiculously long list of girls he harassed. Sean was by far the creepiest guy I'd ever met. And of course, he sold weed. In the early morning around 1 a.m., we were freaking out at our lack of weed. We wanted to smoke pot and watch Trailer Park Boys all night. And those plans were being thwarted by all our normal hookups not responding. Contacting Sean was protested, but we were a bit desperate. She called him, and he immediately offered to drop the dope off. She opted to meet him in a Walmart parking lot. After she got off the phone, she explained to me that Sean was a tad bit obsessed with her, and that he'd stalked her in the past. So she drove us up, and he was there on time. Sweet. The guy didn't know I was there, so she started walking to his car alone and he made her get into his passenger seat. Being the overprotective guy I am, I immediately noped out of my seat and went to his car. I went to the door, opened it and said something like, got the weed, then pulled her out the car and walked back to hers. In the car, she informed me that he touched her thigh as they exchanged. I told her to stay away from him and she agreed and that it looked to be a good idea. So we went to her house and smoked his weed. In retrospect, I'm lucky it wasn't laced. And he started texting her dozens of messages, calling her a plethora of insults and talking about doing all kinds of things to me. We laughed at him and got high as hell and turned on Netflix. A good hour into our watching session, she got a phone call from him. She tosses it on speaker and he says, I'm outside your house. We look at the main window and there he is standing on the sidewalk like a jackass. Considering we had pot, used pipes all around the house, and tons of illegally obtained pills, we felt like calling the cops would be a bad idea. So we went upstairs and watched him from behind the curtain, freaking out. He stood outside for at least an hour, maybe two before leaving. I spent four to five nights out of the week at her house, and at least two of them would include finding him standing around the house or in his car. This went on until we got arrested for drunk driving where they found the crap ton of devil's lettuce in his car. So yeah, kids, don't do drugs. Two thousand and three in Baghdad. 
My unit came in May, right after the initial push. We took over the compound that looked like an Iraqi base. Anyway, we were setting up sleeping quarters and my unit takes over the old medical building. We can clearly see blood on the stairs and I'm not talking sprinkles. I'm talking puddles of blood from the unit that had come before us and clearly saw combat in there. A few days go by and I'm laying down on my cot, trying to sleep, when suddenly I feel someone stare at me. I look up and see a soldier that clearly wasn't American. It was an old Iraqi soldier just standing there in the middle of the room. I'm sure it wasn't just me being half asleep because another one of my friends mentioned it a few days later. It was profoundly creepy. I work the night shift at a live in drug rehab. We have kids, newborn to six years. I was shampooing one of our daycare members and had the door propped open with a heavy metal chair. One of our children, an adorable little blonde girl in a white dress styled nightgown, had come out of a room and was under the chair. It was around 3 a.m. and I yelled at her to get her little pup back to bed. She giggled and ran down the hall. I turned off the machine and followed her but didn't see her. I went into her and her mum's room to make sure she'd gotten to bed. She was in fact already in bed, fast asleep, in matching shirt and pyjama pants. There's no way she could have got changed that quickly. I'm a 20 year old female. This story happened when I was about 15 and lived in the backside of a relatively nice suburban neighborhood. My street ended in a cul-de-sac and my house was one of the four or five in the circle. When I was little, there was nothing behind the cul-de-sac other than a field with woods. But as I got older, they continued to build onto the neighborhood. And when I was around 14, they started building in the field behind my home. At the time, it was just a small ladder shaped road with maybe one or two houses being built towards the back. I had a friend, I would walk or ride my bike to see that lived on the other side of the neighborhood. I would usually walk down my road and through the neighborhood to get to the other side to her house, but this newly built road cut straight across the back and cut the trip to her house almost in half. So on this specific day, I chose to walk with my little puppy to her house on this new back road. The road was in construction, so no one was ever really back there, secluded in the back side of the neighborhood lined by thick Kentucky forest. I had one headphone in through my iPod classic and was jamming out, kind of skip walk slash dancing, all ignorant teenagers happy to see my friends, stupidly not paying attention to my surroundings. That's when I noticed that most of the construction crew and trucks were already gone and saw two men talking to each other by one of the houses. I couldn't tell if they were looking at me or not and I got a strange vibe from the guys so I kept an eye on them and clicked my iPod off, pulling my dog a bit closer and just kept walking. They quickly rushed to a truck parked on the road parallel to me and turned it on. They sat there for a few seconds idle and then pulled off relatively slow once I had passed them on my respective street. They went down and turned around on the connecting road and started to pull up slowly behind me. My, this is weird, alarm started going off and I pick up my pace a bit. They did the same. We both slowly increase our pace until I leaned down, scooped up my dog and started running at full speed. My heart pounding in my ears. Their truck's front bumper was basically at my heels, running faster than I ever thought I could. The truck still increasing in speed. I cut a hard right off the road and down the steep hill into a small strip of forest between this new road and the backside of a few other houses down the hill a bit. As I slid on dirt and rocks at full speed, clutching my dog to my side, I heard the truck slam on the brakes right above me. I slid into this thin bush and laid flat. My dog made a whimpering sound trying to squirm out of my arms and I covered his mouth and nose with my hand and held my breath. The two men had gotten out of the truck maybe 10 feet away from me at the top of this little steep drop off. I remember staring at the sky through the bush, flat on my back, dead still as they started to come towards me, searching for me. Where'd she go? The one man said to the other, shh, shut up. 
The other muttered back, "Hey." He called, drawn out, almost like how someone would say, "Come out, come out!" While playing hide and seek. I was frozen in this bush in total fear, as the men leaned over the bush and somehow didn't look straight down. Honey, he called again, and I stared straight up at his nostrils. The evening sun casting a dark shadow over his eyes, the bill of his baseball hat. Hell, I don't know," he says, frustrated and quiet, and started to turn around. "Let's get out of here," the other said, already running back up the hill to the truck. I laid there until the truck pulled away with the puppy clutched to my chest, and I ran back down the hill and all the way home. I ran in the door and slammed it behind me, basically throwing my dog down and turning around to peep out the glass to make sure I wasn't followed. I told my parents, but they said. To not take the road to my friend's house anymore. I wish they'd done more, but it was in the past now, right? I hope those guys never hurt anyone or tried to chase anyone else with their truck. So weird guys in the truck from my old neighborhood. Let's not meet again. I worked evenings as a closing manager at a store that closed at nine. A dude pulled up at about 4:30 p.m. and sat there for half hour, and then from five until nine would go out and dig in his red toolbox for a while, and then go back and sit in the truck in pattern. I joked that he was going to rob us, but as the night went on, his pattern never changed. So at nine, he still hadn't left and was messing around in his toolbox. I called the police, and I thought he must have been waiting for us to leave with a night deposit. So the police rolls up and he's driving out and almost flips his truck over by driving sideways off the hill, and goes to the gas station. They arrest him for felony possessions, felony impersonation, and four and three drug possessions, etc. Pretty creepy. I seriously wonder what his intentions were with us in the store. I'm forty something, and this happened way back when the world was not such a scary place. I was born with kidney disease, and had several surgeries from ages one till eleven until they got it right. This instance was when I was about five. I had just been released from the hospital, and Mum had to go stop at the pharmacy, the only one in our little town on the way home, from me being discharged to pick up my meds. She pulled into the strip mall where the pharmacy was located. Apparently, some store was opening in the center, because there was music and I saw balloons everywhere. But I was so tired. I had been laying on the back seat and remembered looking out and then laying down and Mum locking the doors. I rolled down my back window about five inches, as we live in Florida, so you can never sit in the car with windows up, and telling me not to leave the car. I think I fell asleep. I awoke to the horror of an arm reaching through the window to unlock the door. It was a clown. A clown was coming to get me, kill me for all I knew. I never trusted clowns. He opened the back door, and I jumped over the seat in front and laid on the horn, screaming like a wild child. My mother and everyone else within earshot came running. The clown was apologetic, offering a twisted balloon in the shape of a giraffe, saying he just wanted to give it to me. No, thank you. No way. I was inconsolable, and that began my unnatural fear of clowns. I even hated Ronald McDonald. Sorry, a clown is a clown. A person hiding their face, even at five, and I had no time for it. Fast forward two years, I'm seven in the hospital, sharing a room with two other kids and a free bed. For those of you who don't know, kidney problems are miserable. You have to pee. You can't, and when you do, it hurts badly. I'm just out of surgery, and we get visitors to cheer us. Clowns. I'm groggy and losing my mind, crying, screaming, and again inconsolable. Why the hell are the clowns in my room? I didn't ask for them. I'm sick and in pain. Get the hell away from me. After they remove the clowns and the nice nurse sits with me until I fall asleep, I wake up to find a giraffe balloon that a clown left me. Sure, it's probably a coincidence. I think giraffe is the basic balloon animal required for clowns. Matters not to me. I'm an adult now, and I swear to heavens, if any clown approaches me, I will consider it a threat to my life, and drop kick him immediately.
I work as a nurse in a psychiatric unit, which is conveniently tucked away around the back of an old hospital. I'm on night shift at the moment, and most of the night is spent trying to convince manic patients to return to their beds. We were having a strangely quiet night. The staff usually sit in the corridor at the intersection between the male and female sides of the ward. We can hear everything that's going on better from there and intervene quickly if need be. There's a shower room located just to the left of where we sit. It has a toilet and short wall partitions separating the showers from the far corner of the room. As we were sitting there, the doors to the shower room slowly crept open. No big deal. We got up, closed it again, and went on with the night. It happened again, and about an hour later again. We thought nothing of it. After closing the door a second time though, we soon heard the sounds of running water. I got up to check and found the tap in the shower room was running. I thought it must have been faulty, but when I tried to turn it off, it spun easily and stopped running water. Feeling a little freaked out now, I checked around the partition of the shower in case a client was, somehow, hiding there, but there was no one. When I turned to walk back, I felt a sudden chill on the back of my neck and heard what sounded like gas hissing behind me. I glanced back around and checked the shower, which seemed to work fine, and just assumed there was trapped air or something happening. The next night, we were sitting in the same place, and again, it was an unusually quiet night, until around 2 a.m., when we heard a massive bang and then a dull thud, as if something had hit against a wall and then slid to the floor. The noise seemed to be quite close, and we hurriedly looked through each dormitory and individual patient's room, expecting that one of the patients had fallen, but everyone was still soundly asleep apart from one patient who told us she had trouble sleeping the last few nights and asked to watch some television in the sitting room. We continued with our search but couldn't seem to find anything to explain the sound and sat back down in the corridor where we started to talk about ghosts and joking about being haunted. The patient, who couldn't sleep, asked if she could smoke in the toilet. We occasionally let people do this during the night as we aren't allowed to let them out out of the unit after 10 p.m and trying to tell an avid smoker they can't have a cigarette is a sure way to start a fight that'll cause everyone to wake up. We said she could have a quick one in the shower room before going back to bed, and she asked for one of us to come in with her. When we asked why, she explained that it's because it freaks her out, that there are spirits in there that are trying to come through the mirror. We hear stuff like this all the time from patients on a regular basis, so we don't think much of it offered her some reassurance and agreed to go to the bathroom with her. While we were in there, she talked about seeing the ghost of a man in her room, which kept her up at night. She then stopped talking abruptly and looked confused before going over to peer around the partition. I asked her what was wrong and she shushed me and asked me in a whisper if I heard what she heard. I admitted I couldn't hear anything. Again, it's a common occurrence for people to talk about auditory hallucinations on our ward but asked her what she could hear. She said she thought she heard a dripping sound, but there was no running water. And when she checked behind the partition, she heard a hissing sound. I suggested she finish her cigarette and go back to bed. And she asked for some medication to calm her down, then said, man, I hate that bathroom. The door opened and closes itself, you know. After she went back to bed, I was telling the other staff about this and we were joking about how much of a freaky coincidence it all was. We were still discussing it when day staff came in. When the first nurse arrived, she came over to ask us how the shift was, and we asked her if she believed in ghosts in a jokey way. She said she didn't, but that she had some bad memories of the wards that really freaked her out. She told us the worst thing she ever saw was 20 years ago when she was doing the hourly checks on the ward just to check on each patient every hour to make sure they're okay. She couldn't find one patient and went to the shower room because she could hear running water. She checked around the partition and found the guy lying dead in a pool of blood in the shower. He had hacked himself to death with two blades, an obviously very unwell man. The nurse told us 
that ever since that happened a few times she's gone into the shower room and felt a sudden rush of cold air. It was like someone was trying to run past her. I was on night shift when this following story happened. There's usually skeleton staff on over the night, two trained nurses and three or four nursing assistants. We had a patient with an eating disorder on the ward. At this time, she required constant observation to make sure she wasn't micro-exercising or purging. At night, we'd usually wait until she'd fallen asleep and then position a member of staff just outside the dormitory she shared with three other patients so that patients had a little more privacy to sleep throughout the night. Our ward is in a T-shape, with a male corridor and a female corridor at either end, and the nursing station at the centre. We all sat at the centre of the T-junction, so we could see and hear down each end of the corridor, and we had one member of staff sat outside the female dormitory at the very end of the female corridor. The chair the staff member sat on had its back to the fire door at the end of the corridor. Facing along towards us, we all took turns sitting there overnight. It was a fairly quiet night, with all patients sleeping soundly, a rarity in most cases. We usually had whispered conversations in the corridors amongst each other just to keep us going, and on one occasion, I was sitting on the observation chatting with a colleague when she looked up behind me confused. I asked her what was up, and she said she thought she saw someone moving on the outer side of the fire door. There was a small round window on the door looking out at the trees and path leading around to the bins and back of the unit. I told her to stop creeping me out, and we laughed about it, talking about the last night we had when all this stuff happened when she looked up startled. She said she was positive something moved past the glass and she dared me to get up and look outside. I was in the middle of not so politely declining this request when I heard a thud on the fire door behind me like it had just been kicked. I froze and we exchanged looks of horror just as there was a very gentle knock at the door. Needless to say, we both freaked. I jumped out of my chair and she came hurrying towards me both of us full of nervous giggles. It took some persuasion from both of us before we managed to go and look out the window. Of course, there was nothing there. The night went on and we continued to joke and speculate about what we saw and heard. She brought a chair up to sit next to me, outside the dormitory, for emotional support, and I insisted I wasn't gonna look out the window for the rest of the night. A few hours later, Someone else was sat on the observation, and I was chatting in the middle of the junction with another nurse. One of our colleagues steps out of the office at the junction, looks up at the corridor and gasps. She pointed at the fire door and said she was sure she saw someone with a pale face staring through the window before it vanished. A new round of speculation started as we theorized as to what it could be when the door to the female dormitory burst open and a patient came stumbling out of the corridor, running past the nurse's assistant on the observation and straight to the corridor at us. She looked terrified and half asleep, so we assumed she was sleepwalking. We caught her as she reached us at the junction and began attempting to soothe her, but she kept trying to push past our hands, muttering in a scared voice, No! There's someone there! There's someone there! We eventually tried to engage with her, but she was either in too deep a sleep or too groggy. Eventually, we managed to calm her down and return her to the dormitory. But when she got to her bed, she stopped again and asked if the nurse had to stand over her all night. We assured her there was no one standing over her all night, and she looked confused but allowed us to settle her into bed where she promptly fell asleep. Our adrenaline was running high at this point, and matters weren't helped when the haunted tap started playing up again, turning itself on in the cursed bathroom. We were so freaked out, one of the nurses refused to walk around the ward on her own while others remained skeptical about all of it. It was maybe a week later when we were back on shift, when we had the same setup, with one member of staff sat alone at the observation and the rest of us in the middle of the corridor, when a nursing assistant, who hadn't been there the first night, stepped out of the office behind us and shouted, who the hell is that? She was loud enough to make us all jump. 
and we looked down the corridor to where she was pointing at the fire door and a poor, pale, freaked out staff member sat in front of it. The nursing assistant then explained that as she had stepped out the office, she had glanced at the fire door and thought she saw something white shining in. She then did a double take and realized it was a pale face of a blonde woman pressed up against the window. The nursing assistant said that she had shouted and the face dropped down, as if the person or whatever it was had fallen. We all went together to peer out and of course there was nothing there. I called the site manager. There was always one manager on call at nights to handle any big issues and suggested there may have been a person going around the building looking through the windows. She didn't seem that concerned with the story and just suggested that no staff leave the building until morning, which is a typical rule anyway. Of course, a paranormal encounter isn't the only explanation for this. A living, breathing person going around staring through our windows was creepy enough, especially since the fire door didn't have a lock and was often blown open by the wind. Another week or so passed and a different staff rotated on shift. I told one of the nurses all the stories that had happened to us on the shift and she was petrified, saying that she always got an eerie feeling on the ward at night. Later that night, a member of staff from another ward on the unit popped in to borrow something. He had worked at the hospital for almost 30 years and had been in every ward on the unit at some point. The nurse I was working with told him that she was freaked out and asked if he had experienced any hauntings on the ward. He seemed amused and asked, like what? She told him about the taps turning on and off, about the patient claiming there were spirits in the mirrors. He seemed skeptical and shrugged it off, but agreed it was a new one to him. He then said he'd never had any hauntings or wood experiences on the ward, but said that a lot of the staff through the years had complained about spooky stuff always happening at the female dormitory at the end of the corridor. Again, I'm not necessarily claiming it all had ghosts or something, but it was definitely unsettling, to say the least, while on night shift. One summer, I was running a poker league in the recreation center of a retirement complex. The property was built on land where my friend's grandfather used to have a flowery nursery many years ago. Despite it being brand new, it was a seriously creepy building. My skin would just crawl just being there. Lights would flicker, it was cold all the time, and it wasn't comfortable. You could just feel something was there. One night, after the players had left, I was hurried cleaning up, so I couldn't get out of there as fast as I would have liked to. I was ready to go and was halfway to the door when I realized I'd forgotten my keys and was heading back out when someone cleared their throat in my ear. It sounded like a man, it was deep and directly in my left ear, unmistakable. I bolted, left the doors unlocked, lights on, jumped in my car and drove home to get to my boyfriend at the time. He came back with me and checked the place out and there was no one there. Months later, I caught up with a friend whose grandfather had owned the nursery. I told her the story of the night and how scared I was. She looked at me like I was pulling her leg and proceeded to tell me that when her grandfather had passed away, her aunt had come home for the funeral. She insisted on sleeping in his bed for the night and when she woke up the next morning, she told her family how she had heard her father clearing his throat throughout the whole night. I'm in the Navy and about 15 years ago, I was standing watch in a submarine engine room. We were underway and I can't for the life of me remember where to or from or if we were just making circles. It was the mid watch and I sat down to catch up on some logs. That's when I heard a woman's voice. This was long before we had women on subs and felt the hairs on my neck stand straight up. I got up and looked around to find the others who were all talking or doing their daily tasks. I thought maybe I had dozed off and dreamt it. I sat back down and heard it again and it sounded like it was coming from outside the hatch I was sitting under. I said, screw this out loud and went to just be around the other guys on watch. I still get chills just thinking about it now. I work the overnight shift at my local hardware store. Let's call it Gnome Depot for anonymity's sake. 
Every so often in certain areas, there will be some weird things that happen, such as boxes falling off perfectly flat carpets, products that will fall off their hooks, disembodied footsteps, some faint voices, and an uncomfortable feeling of being watched. Also, there's sometimes a faint smell of perfume coming from that area, while some of it could very well be other associates in the store. We have about six to ten associates in the store all night. We all usually keep to our own departments and don't go wandering off. The area in question is also kind of out of the way of any area most associates would go to, such as the break room slash time clock, etc. So we don't usually go there unless we have to. I worked in an airspace museum in my late teens and early 20s. Huge echoey building full of wartime planes and spacecrafts and tons of history. It was a pretty cool place. I heard a ton of spooky stuff, whether you were alone or in a group. I was closing up one night after a catering ordeal, and while I was mopping I felt something behind me and I heard a, pardon me, in a man's voice. I stepped to the side and when no one passed me I turned around to see if he actually just needed something but there was no one there. Late that same night I went to clock out and as I passed under a balcony I was hit with one of those big black binder clips that you use to hold a stack of documents together. I look up, totally dark, understandable it was close to two in the morning. I continued walking and got hit with another binder clip. I sped walked away and heard a third clip hit the ground behind me. When I got out, the auto alarm set, meaning I was the last worker in the building, and I got out of there real quick. Never told anyone, though I'm sure they would have all believed me. That place is known for paranormal activity, especially now. I am an armed, uniformed security officer in my city. Well, two years ago, my company was providing services for a motel named The Night's Inn. The motel was preparing to shut down for a massive remodel, as well as code and structural updates. Now, the motel was previously two separate motels, but when The Night's Inn bought it, they merged the properties into one. During nearly 20 years of running between both of the original motels, they saw some rather negative events. This location just happens to be within walking distance from the county jail. So when a number of persons were released from custody, they found their way over to this motel over the years. Murders, drug overdoses and suicides were all reported on this property. All these dark events left negative imprints on these grounds. Fast forward to when I worked on the property during the overnight hours and the three events during these separate shifts I worked, and the one I responded to as a cover officer. The first few went very slowly and boring. No one had told my staff the history of the property at this point. Well, the second to last week of operation, I was helping the on-duty night order to prepare the morning breakfast spa, and the kitchen was in part of the building where a long shutdown restaurant once was. The auditor was preparing the waffle batter and filling pictures of orange juice when an unopened 12-pack of canned soda exploded next to a service access stairwell that was padlocked from inside of the service hallway to the kitchen. The auditor's scream was chilling, as well as deafening. Well, due to some of the less than upstanding guests they'd rent rooms to, I began down the stairs to find that the doors were still secure and no one could have entered through them. I then stuck my finger in the puddle of soda, thinking that maybe it had been overheated or something causing them to burst, but no, it was slightly cool. As I look at the auditor still shaking, holding a small kitchen knife trying to calm her down, we both heard a loud little girl giggle, but it sounded unusual. We, needless to say, both bolted from the kitchen and back to the main desk. Five minutes later, the auditor told me, no one has checked in any kids tonight. The following weeks, and the last week of the location being open before the remodel, I was doing standard ground patrols, making sure no doors were unsecured or people fighting. Just around the time I finish, I get a call from the front desk calling a code six priority. 
I ran back to the office, nearly tripping on the staircase in the courtyard. Once I arrived, I saw a young woman with her daughter, just the cutest little three-year-old. The mother was crying uncontrollably, but managed to tell me her husband was not himself, that after nearly an hour in the room, he pulled a knife out of nowhere and started wildly swinging it in the room and at his wife and kid. The wife said that he hates weapons and wouldn't have had one. So I began searching the grounds for the man and found him sitting in a dark corner of the courtyard area. He had the knife in his hand and was blankly staring ahead. Once the knife hit the light, I saw the blood. Then I noticed he was bleeding. I ordered he drop the knife and he slowly started walking towards me. I repeated a second time and then on the third order drew my weapon and ordered that he stop to think about his kid. Right as I did, three local officers sprang from behind me, two with their tasers drawn. In a quick happening display, I heard the deputy order, then followed taser, taser, taser. The local officer took the man into custody and was having me fill out statements when I overheard two of the deputies saying, you know what, Saad? The room they are staying in had a suspicious death a few days ago, but detectives say it was a drug-induced suicide. The other deputy replied, Huh? What are the odds this guy went nuts? I personally think that it's a little too odd that the man commits suicide, comes to find he cut his arms until he bled out, and then a week later a man loses his mind, cuts himself up, is unresponsive the whole time, that he was being spoken to and was just generally out of it. The most damning paranormal event in my opinion that happened was the first week closed for remodeling. I was walking around the inside and another officer stopped in to hang out on his break. I made the suggestion that we sit in the old restaurant and see if the place was for real haunted. He agreed reluctantly. Using a spirit box app on my phone that before that night I thought I overpaid for we sat and asked questions. For about 20 minutes, nothing came through, and we joked that maybe the place wasn't haunted after all. I thought I saw something across the room, so I tried to light it up, but come to find that my flashlight battery had suddenly died. So, while sitting at the table, I pulled my taser out of the holster, and we sat in near pitch darkness in the room, and we used it to light it up. Instantly, the spirit box said, yellow, gun, in the same voice. Now mind you, me and this officer thought we had the same level of training and we were fully certified through the city. But his response was, the hell does it mean by yellow gun? I then proceeded to place my taser on the table and turned its light on. I had never heard so many F-bombs as he stormed out the room. The final incident I'm still unsure of, but the one phrase the suspect yelled, there will be more ghosts here tonight if you enter. Four weeks after that motel closed, I was working a city patrol when the on-duty officer called for priority backup for all available officers on duty. Sam 262 to Night's Inn, what's the situation? The officer responded. Four to six persons had made enter into the back building and barricaded themselves in a room. I was the first responding officer just after 3 a.m. and meet with the on-duty site officer. As we're talking and a third officer arrived, we heard three gunshots ring out from down the hallway. At this time, we contacted the local sheriff's office about the situation. Within minutes, several deputies arrived in active shooter vests and helmets. They attempted to reach the room as we watched from the end of the hallway. Five more shots rang out from the doorway and luckily no one was struck. The deputies fell back to the end of the hallway where the three of us were. A supervisor for the deputies ordered four to watch the hallway as the rest took positions around the building. We asked what they needed to do and he replied to block the entrances to the property and no one comes that isn't an officer. So basically we were to keep out of the way of the impending reporters. SWAT arrived and the deputies pulled back and SWAT took position. The whole time the suspects saw the activity from the window and holes in the door. A lieutenant with the SWAT and public relations office came over to me and the other guys on my staff. And while asking us what happened before, the deputy responded that we all heard from a broken window 
There will be more ghosts if you enter here tonight. Around 5am, a SWAT team armoured vehicle pulled up next to the back of the building and we heard three thumps. SWAT shot OC shells into the room before breaching from the window doorway. And just as soon as we heard the thumps, we see the smoke and five of the suspects being carried out. A sixth was being rushed out on a street board to the ambulance. We come to find the man with the pistol in the room took his five friends hostage and attempted to kill himself when SWAT breached. He later died at the hospital. So I wonder if he joined the other ghosts in the motel. After that night, we no longer provided security at the Night's Inn. Eight months later, it reopened as some new age hipster hotel, and I haven't been to the property for some time now, even though I pass it whenever I work our South City patrol. I wonder how the property is, and if the paranormal activity persisted after the remodeling. This happened when I was about five or six, with my older brother who was around 10. Our family went camping a lot, with another family who had a son around my brother's age. My dad was in the Navy, so my brother and I were used to walking around base to our friends' houses, or to a nearby park, as it was pretty safe. So we had no problems going place to place without our parents. I guess that's why our mum let us ride our bikes down to the park at the campground we were staying at. We had been begging to go, and the park wasn't too far from the spot we were staying at. Of course, at the time I was obsessed with animals, and my only goal in life was to one day work with Steve Irwin, so I bought my dog along. He was fully grown, but not very intimidating and definitely not aggressive. He was a Border Collie, Blue Healer, Black Lab, Australian Shepherd mix that I loved more than anything. My brother and I play until our hearts are content, or as much as we can while still holding onto the dog's leash. We stop so my brother can use the bathroom, and I wait by the wall outside with my dog. I'm standing there just petting him, and this huge guy walks out. I still remember that he was wearing a black jacket and a gray shirt and jeans, and he had a big beer belly and gray hair. My dog, who had never even looked at someone funny before, picked up his ears and stared at the guy, hair standing up in attack position. The guy stopped right in front of me and I felt my whole body go numb and my blood turn cold. I went rigid and pushed back into the wall as far as I could. The man stared into my eyes and stepped closer. My dog was practically rabid at this point, tail up, foaming at the mouth, hair standing up like a cartoon cat and growling and snarling like nothing I'd ever heard before. The man looked at me for a while, then to my dog. I still remember his eyes, brown, but something glossed over. They almost sparkled. My dog stepped towards him and he backed away, eventually turning and carrying on. My brother came out after the guy was gone and I told him there was a stranger or something and he told me the guy had been staring at him too when he was drying his hands. We decided to go back to the camper after that, and we never told our parents because we probably thought we'd get in trouble. Stupid I know, but I was five. I never stopped wondering what would have happened if my dog hadn't have been there. He unfortunately passed a little over a year ago, and that was the only time he'd ever shown aggression like that in his life. They say animals know, and I believe that completely. I also think now that that guy may have been waiting in the bathroom for kids to show up and didn't do anything to my brother because he didn't know if there were any adults outside. Then when he saw I was the only person there, he tried to make a move. I'm not sure what his intentions were, but I'm glad that we didn't meet again. I work in a library and on weekdays we have to go through the building and turn off all the lights. I always hated this, I'm super jumpy, but I always somehow got scheduled only closing shift. One night just after midnight, because we have to wait until it's officially closed, I was going about this routine, and we have study rooms that people can rent out. I knew they were empty because all the keys were checked back in, but out of the corner of my eye I saw movement in one. These lights are motion activated, so that's what caught my attention. 
I reluctantly go look and there's nothing in there. I continue about my task, and lights in the other study rooms keep turning on. It's absolutely freaky, and I never got an answer onto what happened next, except my boss told me that he's gotten reports of weird stuff happening in there. So in my opinion, the place is definitely haunted. This is my dad's story. After he was done in Vietnam, he soon stationed at an air force base in Greenland. They had bad blizzards often there, and when they came through, the base shut down and every section of the barracks would take roll call. These blizzards are intense. There were cables running between all buildings you attached to a person with carabiners, so if there was a sudden whiteout, you didn't get lost and die. They had people die literally 20 meters from shelter because they got lost in bad weather and froze. He said for about five months, every time they locked down for weather, they would hear horrendous screaming outside. Everyone was accounted for, so they didn't risk sending anyone out to investigate, and they wrote it off as an animal. However, every time it was heard, the engine room would be wrecked. Tools everywhere, paperwork all over the floor, tables and toolboxes knocked over. Even one time, a thousand pound jet engine had been lifted from its workbench crane and smashed almost 30 feet away. The hangars and engine room had cameras covering every single possible entrance with spotlights that made them clear even in a whiteout. No animals nor people were ever seen entering or leaving those buildings. And then one day, it just stopped. This was not something that they just shrugged off at all. It cost a lot of money and threw a wrench in at least one surveillance routine which caused a lot of brass from the DOD and CIA to fire down the base commander's neck. This facility, beyond military function, served as a base for a lot of civilian research as well. There was a full investigation using all manner of scientists, engineers and specialists, and they came up with no satisfactory explanation for what was going on. I do not believe in the paranormal, nor did my father but this is the only spooky type of story he has from his 22 years of service. No one knows what happened. It was very strange in either way. Hundreds of people wrote reports and documented this. It wasn't some grease monkey scratching their heads and randomly guessing. As I said, I spoke to my mom. These are the things that I missed. After one of these occasions, the U2 in this shop had all of its electronics turned on. Many of the systems in this plane were specially built for this airframe and this particular cruise mission. The systems were complex and archaic. Very few people knew how to operate this machinery, and the only ones on base that could were two engineers and its crew. It wasn't a simple matter of hitting buttons and flipping switches and stuff. Another time, three barrels of hydraulic fluid vanished and were never found. They doubted the screaming noise was wind because it came in short, irregular bursts and winds never produced these sounds again. They theorized it was a polar bear, but if it was, its coincidental timing was extremely uncanny. Lastly, Control picked up a bunch of weird interference and anomalous readings that, again, had the uncanny timing of happening only when this was going on that they were never able to reproduce these errors in a controlled manner. It's creepy, bizarre, and may or may not be supernatural. I'll leave that down to your own judgment. I worked night shifts for three different jobs, but my most eventful was at the hotel. To start off, it was definitely haunted, and I had three big separate incidents that happened to me involving the paranormal, which I'm going to get into now. So, the first one was only a week into the job. This was a small two-story hotel with hallways inside. I decided to do a round just to make sure things were okay and check things out. Things were quiet as it was around 2 a.m. I reached the upstairs hallway and just strolled quietly along when I heard faint footsteps behind me. I turned saw no one and continued on my way. I kept hearing footsteps as I would walk, so I just started glancing over my shoulder but kept moving. I didn't see a soul, so I started speed walking. This is when the footsteps started turning into shuffling sounds, like someone was dragging their feet on the carpet at a fast rate. 
I didn't turn around that time and started jogging. The shuffling got louder, closer and quicker. At this point I was terrified, and I reached the downstairs lobby at a full run. That's when I heard a loud and rapid breathing slash snorting directly in my ear, along with the feeling of hot breath on my ear. Like someone was out of breath, but exaggerating their gasps. I ran behind the front desk and ducked down in a crouch, covering my ears and had my eyes squeezed shut. It felt like someone was standing directly over me. Then I could feel my hair being lightly brushed, like a light breeze went through it. I was sobbing. I stayed like that for a good ten minutes, too scared to open my eyes. When I finally did get up from the floor, I went to the back room for the rest of the night until the manager came that morning. Risking being thought as a complete whack job, I explained what happened. That's when she told me that the guy before me quit because he almost had the exact same experience. In the five years I worked there, I never went to the upstairs hallway at night again. I would also often see dark shadows down the downstairs hallway, moving along the walls and going around the corner. Once when I saw the shadow, it started moving away from me and turned back toward me, and I ran back for the night. The last incident I had was when I saw a guy, clear as day, standing in the pool area after hours on the security camera. The doors were supposed to be locked, so I got annoyed thinking a guest had ignored the pool hours and managed to get into the area. I had already cleaned up the area and restocked the towels, so I marched out there to kick this guy out. I went through the door and the area was dark, no ripples in the water, nobody in the sauna. The one bathroom door was wide open and empty. There was no one there. I came through the only door in the area and nobody passed me on my way out. So I noped out of there and hid in the back room for the rest of the night. This was a town that boasted to be the most haunted town in the state. So, you know. And just as a side note, I don't have any drugs or mental illnesses. These are not just ghost stories. They really happened to me. And each incident scared the crap out of me. The place is called Atchison, Kansas. It's located along the Missouri River. Atchison was a famous aviator and Amelia Earhart's birthplace and host of an annual Amelia Earhart Festival during July. Along with being one of the most historical cities in Kansas, it's also noted, as I said, as the state's most haunted town, drawing paranormal enthusiasts from all around. I lasted at this hotel for about five years. There was also one incident where I had to have a canine unit guard the lobby because a woman escaped her abusive husband and he was out looking for her with a gun. He had a shootout with the police and was on the run and they put her up in the hotel for safety. So as you can imagine, that was very fun. I was in the Navy and did six months in the Mediterranean. I saw a lot of empty boats, but also small boats full of people and other refugee related events. The one thing that will always stand out though, was the day we cruised past a dead body. It 100% looked like nothing I'd ever seen in a movie. It was like cottage cheese wearing clothes. I assume given the region that the person's skin was much darker before they passed, after death they were severely bloated and white. Had they not had shorts and a shirt on, I'd have never recognised this as a person. I've also been on Liberty in Greece and passed dead bodies on the beach. The desperation of the refugees to cross the sea, I swear, is something else. I used to work as a corrections officer, and I have plenty of really creepy stuff that happened over those five years, but this is by far my favorite incident. I was assigned to the single man cells wing of the jail, which is basically solitary confinement for inmates who are being punished for breaking rules within the jail. At around 5 a.m., medical call for all inmates that need medication to be escorted from my wing to medical to receive their meds. I pull out two guys, restrain them, and instruct them to face the wall and await the guard who will be escorting them. As the three of us are there, I begin to hear a woman crying. I was new to the jail and didn't think anything of it. So I'm just listening to this woman cry. 
when I slowly start to realize a few things. There are no females in this wing, nor in any other wing where the men are. The female wing is down the hall, sealed tight with about three doors in between the hall and the actual wing. There is only about two other males in the wing who are asleep aside from us three. I look up at the inmates and notice they have this kind of smile on their faces as they're watching me realize what's going on. And I ask them, do you guys hear that? One of the inmates responds, almost every night, boss. They went on about other things that would happen in that wing. Water being turned on and off, towels being thrown down on the floor, hearing knocks on the walls. I actually had another incident that night, confirming the knocks heard on the walls in the empty cells. That same night, or rather morning, we were assigned to a certain wing, and we had to do exit door checks, which basically meant going to the exit door of the wing and checking the fire exit door to make sure it was securely fastened, and then radioing it to control every few hours. As I was making my way down a very long hall with empty single-man cells to my left and right, I could hear knocking at the end of the hall. But it wasn't coming from the exit door. It was coming from one of the cells on the right-hand side. As I would gradually move closer, I could hear the knocks getting louder at the end of the hall. That's when I got to the end of the hall and the knocking seemed to have gone away. So I grabbed the exit door to make sure it was secure and a very distinct and loud knock came from the one cell on the right-hand side of me. I'd seen enough horror films to not look into the empty cell and decide it would be best to just get out. I grew up in a small town with no more than a few stoplights and a few thousand residents in the Great Basin Desert of the Western US. For those of you who have never been, you cannot begin to understand just how vast and isolated you can become in my home state. It's a breeding ground for strange people to hide out from the law, keep to themselves, and do whatever it is they do, and remain a secret. As someone who frequently spends days exploring isolated, vast stretches of desert, hours away from cell service in some cases, I unfortunately have a few stories where I was held at gunpoint, or thought I was going to be taken. But those stories are for another day. This is my earliest encounter with someone I wish to never meet. The valley where this story takes place is one where they found a family murdered just a few months prior to this encounter, in fact. It will give you a feel for what happens in the desert. I was roughly 12 at the time, and I'm 22 now. I was with my mom and three younger brothers. My dad and uncle were prospecting for gold, and we got bored. So we thought we'd go hike down into the valley to an abandoned miner's shack about two miles away. No biggie. We've done this many times in the past, and it's cool to see the old ruins. But note, my dad and uncle had the pistols. We did not. We get down there with no issue, and the shack looks clearly abandoned and in disrepair. It appears to be from the 1930s and is resting on a small hill with a dirt road leading to it. We go inside and explore, and all is good, till I see on one of the old shelves brand new canned goods, fresh paper wrappers and all. I thought to myself that it was odd. Perhaps some backpackers left them for the next guy. But boy, was I wrong. We kept exploring this house until I come into a room and see something that I will never forget. The feeling you get when you instantly know something is horribly wrong. And that stuck with me hard. That room had a fresh house cat hung from the rafters of the ceiling with its abdomen split open and the intestines hanging out. It had to have been only a few days old. I never let my mum or brother see it. I just ran to the room that they were in and said that we had to leave. I said I had a bad feeling from those cans. We get out the house and we're about 50 feet away when my brother insists he needs to go to the bathroom. I didn't tell him what I saw because I knew it would freak him out and he had to go, 
So here we are, a baseball throw away from this house, and my brother is going to the bathroom. Just as he finishes from the back side of the hill that the shack is on, comes an old white beat up van. And I remember thinking that this is it. I will never see my dad again. They'll never know what happened to us. Out of the van, I vividly remember seeing four men step out and look in our general direction. I picked up my youngest brother and my mum, the other two, and we took off running. I've never felt more scared in my life. I didn't dare look back to see if they were trailing after us. I couldn't make myself. After what feels like forever, we finally get out the valley and meet up with my dad and uncle. We tell them our story and we get the hell out of there. To this day, I still can't help but wonder if I'd be alive today had I not seen the dead cat before those guys got to the shack. So to the men, mutilating cats in the desert, let's never meet again. I work in high-end security. I was protecting a client's residence and was alone on the property in the guard shack. The guard shack is a small building close to but detached from the main mansion. It was around 1 a.m. and the building was locked tight and armed. I received a phone call from the house line coming from the staff room. I answered the phone and there was nothing but silence. I immediately went to the area and found the room empty. I swept the area and that floor of the house but found nothing. I went back to the shack. Five minutes later, I get another call on the phone from the house, this time from the spooky basement. Nothing on the other line, just silence. I loaded around in my gun and went into the basement. I checked every corner and then every inch of the house and found nothing at all. It never happened again after that. That house creeped me out and most of the other security agents also had spooky happenings there. A buddy of mine was stationed at Kadena Air Force Base in Okinawa in the Orties. It was a regular day full of standard base activity indoors and out when the sirens went off followed by a warning for all staff to report to the base's mess hall. My friend and everyone else were quite confused but followed orders. Upon arrival at the hall they found it was full of the base staff with a uniformed officer taking role the base commander settled everyone down and advised them that everyone was just taking a short break, that there was nothing to worry about and that everyone would be back to work shortly. Everyone sat at the long lunch table scratching their heads and discussing what could be up. This particular room in the hall was interior and had no windows. Once the roll was completed and everyone accounted for, the commander left and soldiers carrying automatic rifle closed the doors to the hall and stood inside them at attention, essentially stopping anyone from leaving. This raised the chatter quite a bit, but nobody panicked. Only a few minutes later, an incredibly loud engine sound could be heard approaching the base as whatever was making the noise sounds lands and it shook the entire island. Framed photos fell off the walls and trophies in glass cases are shaken over. The engine hum and shaking then cease. Chatter again rises sharply as speculation about what the hell is going on increases. After about an hour, the noise starts up again and the island shakes again and whatever it was takes off and quickly fades. Shortly after, the base's commander enters and says everyone can get back to work, warning them not to discuss today's break and simply forget about it. When I asked him what he thought it was, he immediately suggested that it was some sort of classified skunk weapon spy plane, maybe the Aurora needing to land for emergency repairs or refueling. Of course, he said, since they kept us all from seeing it, we'll truly never know. A co-worker of mine on my shift, in a post a mile over, heard humming in the dead of night. She got scared and went to turn on the overhead lights just to come back and find everything tipped over. She abandoned her post, came to mine, and I told her a story about a demon that likes to drag people to hell and turn their skin into sentient clothing for other demons. Story came out of my ass, but I made it sound like a local legend. Said it wanted her for her pretty tattoos. She casually brushed it aside, but didn't return to the post again that night. 
because she was scared. When I worked the graveyard shift at a 24-hour porno store slash strip club, on a night, I happened to fortunately not be working, there was an incident in the gay room. Basically, the details I gathered from the people who were working there at the time was that a big guy came in and went into the room. A few minutes later, another dude comes in basically crawling out and crying. He's screaming that there's a man in there sexually assaulting people. Now, I worked with a plethora of jacked bouncers who literally feared nothing except that back room. The bouncers all came up with excuses not to go in there and convinced a cashier friend of mine to do it. So he grabs a baseball bat that we had behind the counter and adventures into what only can be described as a dark, teemingly gay cavern of misdeeds. Now, we were all afraid to get the police involved in this kind of stuff because not only was the place mafia run, but it was also illegal to have a gay room, which was definitely the place's biggest money maker. We didn't want the wrath of the cops or mafiosos on us, so we never involved the police. Anyway, he gets inside and this big gentleman is wearing a mask and has all of the dudes there lined up with no pants on. And he's just taking them all, one by one, leaving them bleeding and terrified. My cashier friend Dave walks in there and starts yelling at the dude. Dude, you can't be doing this back here. The guy starts sobbing, apologizing profusely and runs out the store. The ambulance arrived shortly after and took a few of the guys to the hospital. This is sadly a true story. And I really hope the people involved didn't catch anything and were okay. As okay as you can be after that, of course. We were stationed in Okinawa. Oh man, it's a gold mine of stuff. Driving through a tunnel coming back from Churmari Aquarium, I woke up to my friends freaking out. There was this phantom moped that zipped by with this girl on the back, and she left a trail of long flowing black hair like the grudge ghost, oily looking flowing hair. I thought I was dazed, but we talked about it the next day. I think the story was some girl was kidnapped by guys on mopeds driving through the tunnel when they crashed, construction or another car, and I think they were decapitated or something terrible. Also, I thought I saw a ghost in my room, and some other areas. I drank a lot back then, so I passed it off. Cadena was rumored to have a lot of ghosts, gate three, I think. I thought it was just an excuse to keep it closed. They also have a bunch of buildings which are allegedly haunted that they still use. I think one of the marine bases supposedly has the ghost of a samurai run up and down the streets. Just Google haunted Okinawa and you'll find a bunch of stories. They were good times. I worked about three months full-time at McDonald's night shift. The first week, some cooked-up man looked at my name tag and said, Hey, Mary, I'll wait until these doors open and cut you up into pieces. So I removed my name tag after that. The second week, someone grabbed my tie and tried to punch me, but I had the reflexes to close the drive through on his hand first and removed my tie after. The third week, I got my first drunk driver. The guy had an open 40 ounce bottle of vodka between his lap and I called the police so that they could pick him up. Happened once a week after that, in general. There's a lot more, but working nights is just awful. People are horrible when it's dark outside, more horrible than usual anyway. I was 12 and I had come down with a suspected case of glandular fever. So mum booked me in with our family GP. Mum loved him since he had delivered my sister eight years earlier and we had been seeing him ever since. Mum and I are in the waiting room. She's flipping through the terrible magazines and I'm just watching the fish in the tank. The receptionist pops her head out and calls my name. So mum turns to me and says, you're old enough to go in by yourself. A bad feeling hit the pit of my stomach. I shake my head and insist she comes with me. There was never a nurse or anyone else present during appointments, and there was no way I was going in alone. 
Now, nothing weird had ever happened with our doctor before. He was always professional and kind, but this time I felt uneasy. He was checking my lymph nodes for inflammation. The neck ones were swollen. Then he checked my armpits. Swollen. I'm getting a weird vibe, a bad vibe, like he was enjoying it. Mum didn't notice. Finally, he checks my groin. Swollen. I was very uncomfortable with him at this point. It just felt weird. Bad gut feeling. Diagnosis, glandular fever. We left and I didn't say anything about the experience. But a few months later, our doctor abruptly left the practice. The new doctor was a lovely lady and I breathed a sigh of relief to see him gone. Four years later, mum comes into my room. Remember Dr. Gardner? Well, he's in jail for molesting his friend's kids while they were all away on holiday. She tells me with surprise. No. I relate my experience to her and she was shocked. She had no idea. That was weird in itself, as mum has had weird premonitions over the years. So glad I insisted that mum accompany me with a pedo doctor. Could have been a lot worse than just the bad gut feeling. Former USGC here. I saw a ghost and some creepy stuff happen when we were removing the old Fresnel lens from the Presque Isle light in Michigan. Also, I've seen some weird and creepy lights in St. Elmo's fire near the old Washango light. Compasses and radios all quit. Radar and GPS wouldn't work either. The light near Sturgeon Bay is haunted as well. And we stayed at the light near two rivers and the whole family saw the ghost. There were several lights in the Great Lakes that are open to active reserve and retired military members as vacation rentals. We stayed at Raleigh Point Lighthouse and the Sherwood Point Lighthouse. They have visitor logs that now look like a diary and multiple stories in there are about the hauntings dating back to at least the 70s. I know that Sherwood Point, at the very least, is quite haunted. I work the night shift in a hotel. One night, just as I was minding my own business, I hear a noise coming from the restaurant. My ears prick up, and I wonder what it could be. The sound was loud, and as it continued, I heard the sound of plates breaking. That was seriously creepy. So I get the security guard, and we go and check it out. When we arrive, we're astounded there's not a thing out of place. We both stand there flabbergasted how we both had heard what we had, and yet there was no evidence. The breakfast guy also said he once saw a man in the kitchen at 5 a.m. And as he went to say something to him, he walked straight through the wall. Safe to say the hotel was haunted as hell. On many nights, the smell of food cooking came from the restaurant, I mean big cooking. I don't know what the invisible people were cooking, but it smelled great. Many times I felt like I was living the movie The Shining. There was also one security guard that reported a young man had disappeared on encounter in the parking lot, and another lady reported two young phantom men in the same parking lot on another occasion. You can say it was creepy to work there. I worked solo graveyard shift at the call center for a small security business. I see an alarm go off for the alley door. This has never happened, and I don't know how they got through the lock. I called the local security guard working and then police and watched the thief on cameras test all the doors while I waited for the guard. I was behind three more locked and coded doors, but it was scary hearing him go up and down the stairs to the alley through the wall. He left five minutes after, but it was terrifying. I wish he'd have been caught. I worked overnights at Walmart. The parking lots were always empty, beside the random once in a while dudes who would park up and sleep. One night I was chilling in my car on my lunch break when I noticed some headlights turn on behind me. They stayed on for a bit then eventually turned off, but when I looked up I noticed there was no car not even pulling out or anything. 
I was terrified to go back inside, thinking I was just going to get swooped up and kidnapped, so I sat there for the rest of my break, looking in all directions to make sure I wasn't going crazy. But I never saw the car, only the lights. I still think about it randomly, and my boyfriend tries to write it off as, maybe it was streetlights far in the distance making it look like it was bright behind you. But no, it was like ten feet behind me as if someone had pulled up a light. Then poof, just gone. I wish I could explain it. I'm a 15 year old male, and I live in an apartment with my parents, younger brother, elder cousin, and grandfather. However, all of these people had gone over to a party, which, because of tuition, I couldn't attend. Now, one thing to bear in mind is that I'm a huge WWE fan. Anyway, I was coming up the elevator, which was on the far end of the hall, and as soon as the door opened, I saw a man at the other end, probably around 5'10", just as tall as me. He was wearing a mask, but the creepy part was that it was a mask with devilish goat horns. Now my house is right in the middle of the lobby, and I'm pretty spooked by his mask, but hey, everyone has to wear one, and maybe he's being creative. But that all changed when he tilted his head and from a back pocket produced a vicious looking knife. You should know that we are both at the end of our respective lobbies. He hadn't moved, and my ass was about to move hard. I ran and tried to get to my door before him, but he was surprisingly fast and able to cover a similar distance to me. When I realized that I wouldn't be able to reach it first, and that I would still need time to unlock my door, that's where my WWE comes to save me. As I see he closing in on me, I hit him with a move called the spear, which is basically running into your opponent's belly with your shoulder. He was coming pretty fast, so I took advantage of the speed and crashed him with the spear. I then quickly opened the door and locked it. I called my dad before the police because, well, I don't know why, but of course, by the time that they reached them, he was gone. It still terrifies me to think what would have happened if I hadn't have trusted a wrestling move with my life. When I was in Israel, I saw something. My folks and I were chilling about 10 p.m. enjoying the cool evening looking at stars when they became obscured by a giant black triangular shape that passed over. I said, what the hell is that? We all looked and waved and it spotlighted the entire city block as if to say hello back. Or was it getting a better look at us? It made a quiet hum as it passed and turned west, moving very slowly. It's been eight months since I started working at the night shift in a hotel. No one told me anything until I started asking because of weird experiences. My shift begins at 10 p.m. and ends at 8 a.m. I honestly love it because it gives me time to dedicate to my hobby since I only need to answer the phone and give out keys. It was rather sooner than later that I started to notice weird things. For example, it's really common to see the lights of the hallway on the second floor turning on and off during the night. Sometimes some doors will get open or closed without anyone near them. At the end of the hallway of the first floor, sometimes you can see a shadow person at the end, and you can also hear someone say your name in a really low tone or hear people talking at all hours of the night. I'm the only worker in at night, and most people that come here come for work, so they get to bed really early. The most extreme experience was a day when a girl from the morning shift got here and we were talking on the kitchen about that day's schedule. Without any warning, every cooking pot and cutting board, dozens of them in different sizes, just flew around the kitchen. Most of my co-workers say that they would not work here at night because they're scared of ghosts. But honestly, I'm so used to these things that I just go and clean the mess made during the night. I've had a lot of other experiences in other places as well, dealing with the paranormal. I worked in Arlington National Cemetery while I was in the army. The tomb guard always talked about seeing or just hearing soldiers marching some nights. We were cataloging graves one night, when I thought I saw a soldier and my team up ahead. 
so I called over to him. He answered from behind me. When I looked back, the other soldier was gone. I'm a skeptic, and I believe everything paranormal has a real-world explanation. But I'm still trying to figure that one out. I was a lone worker in a building doing IT support, and I hear the buzzer go off at around 2 a.m. So I walk over to the door and I'm about to press the release to open it and ask what the person wants. It was a large business park, so maybe he was looking for a certain building. But as I reached for the buzzer, he grabbed the door very quickly, which made me realize what I was about to do. I asked him who he was and he just said, John. I asked what he wanted and he said he left some files inside. I asked where he left them and I would get them. He said I wouldn't know where they were and he should just grab them. Basically told him to leave after that. I was on edge for the rest of my shift. What the hell did this guy want? Why was he here trying to get in here at 2 a.m.? So many questions and no answers. Something you need to understand is that in a lot of ways, my parents are wonderful and I love them. But I had a lot of repressed mental issues as a kid. Well, more than I do now. I was miserable, felt trapped and scared because I knew I could never live up to certain expectations. Plus I was a sensitive kid, which unfortunately clashed with my parents' approach of handling things. Not to mention I was basically an outcast in school for years. I decided to run away. I thought that since I hated my life so much, I was already suicidal, and I thought I might as well run away to give it one last shot. I had this whole idea planned out in my head. Stupid move, and naive I know. And now that we have gotten that out of the way, here's the story. I decided the best way to do it was to be with another person, and coincidentally found a local forum where kids and teenagers were asking for runaway buddies. There were no recent enough posts, so I made one of my own using a fake name and throwaway email address. And after a while, while I was at my lowest point, I got a reply. He introduced himself as a 20 something year old man, if I remember right. I was about 14 and he said he was fed up with society and was putting together a group of runaways to live in the forest together, surviving off nature's gifts. I could see this was all shady, but at the same time I was desperate and not thinking clearly at all. So I reply asking for more details. He asks my phone number and if we can talk. I didn't feel comfortable talking on the phone. I asked if I could get more details first. Which forest were you thinking of? What would we do in winter? How many others have signed up for this? Then he sent a very scary response. Are you stupid? I said, give me your Facebook with a few choice words added in. His facade had dropped. I didn't respond after that, and neither did he as far as I was aware, as I stopped checking the email after a while. I don't know who he was or what he was really planning for me. Probably the most messed up thing though is that for a moment I actually considered meeting with him. I thought he could do what I couldn't. But I'm much better now. I don't want to even think what could have happened or about the time of my life in general. So, creepy guy on the internet. Let's not meet. I was taking my shift in the guard tower at our firebase in Afghanistan one clear night. Through my night vision, I saw something hovering above an LP slash OP we had about a kilometer from our base. It appeared to have lights on the edges of a triangular craft, and it looked like it was dropping flares over the guys. However, without the night vision, I couldn't see the craft or the flares at all. I radioed in, and they said that they couldn't see anything. The craft and the flares then vanished. I also saw a very large circular craft without lights pass over FOB Gazni that was being chased by a bunch of choppers, and a guy that glowed when viewed through my night vision stepped into a bush in an empty field and vanished. This happened to me about three months ago. I work at a hive, and as a night shift stalker, and it's two hours after we close. 
I'm in the frozen section away from my co-workers, who are in the grocery aisle, and out of nowhere, some guy taps me on the shoulder and says, Ah, uh, I fell asleep in the restroom. Can you let me out the store? We eventually let him out, but I swear the moment he tapped me on the shoulder and I turned to face him, I almost instinctively tried to run. I think you would have too, if it had happened to you. I grew up in an old Victorian era boarding house in Iver, South Carolina. Everything about that town and house and its surrounding area is just creepy. We saw and felt all kinds of weirdness in there, but that's only the beginning of my experiences. Hot spots, cold spots, apparition of a man who looked like he was dressed in a suit and a fedora who always was with a young woman who was wearing a dress like an old school teacher from when the house used to be a boarding house and the ghosts of people that had been lynched from an old pecan tree in my backyard. I'm used to seeing some messed up stuff at this point, and that's only part of it. Fast forward to 2014. I was enlisted into the US Navy and got assigned TAD to USS Sturet in between my A and C schools. I was coming back to the ship one night and I see someone aloft. That's not right, no one's supposed to be aloft at night, but somebody's probably got an okay from it somewhere, so whatever. I see them walking around, then I get up to the brow, look up and see no one. Eh, guess they went in already. Didn't think anything about it, and the next morning we go underway. I went up to the smoke deck late one night, on that underway, and on my way there I see the upper half of a guy's face. I could see coveralls with his second class crows visible through the porthole window of one of the airlock doors that you go through to go outside. I make eye contact and shuffle over to let him in. He shuffled over too. Okay, I'll open it guy, whatever. I open it. Look around, but don't see him. Uh, maybe he went for another cigarette. I climb up there and see some other people in the dark. Faces occasionally lit by the cherry from their cigarette, but I don't see the guy. I ask if anyone saw someone come up, because there was a guy that was about to hop through the airlock, but didn't. I just wanted to make sure he was okay. You saw him too, huh? Yeah, of course I did, I say. Is the guy here or what? Do we need to call man overboard? Uh, no, he's dead. Uh, maybe not if we don't turn this around. No, another guy goes. I mean, he hung himself. What? Apparently, he was a control too. They got into a love triangle that went bad and he couldn't deal. So, yeah, that happened. I was told to come over here and look up by one of the guys and was shown the exact light he hung himself from. Apparently, sometimes you can see him walking around there at night and you always feel the cold spot right there. And I was shown where. Screw me. Anything else I ought to know, I asked? Yeah, let me show you Andrew Sterrett's sword. It'll always shock you though, no matter how many times you touch it. Or if you touch something metal beforehand. Apparently he killed a kid with it. Yeesh, oh, you're a sonar tech, right? Yeah, man, I'm in our dive right now, but yeah, okay. Okay, go ask Chief Moon about the skid. I think she's in sonar right now anyway. Okay, I'll bite. I head back down and go to the sonar room. Chief Moon was there and I ask her about the skid. Ah, hell no, that place freaks me out. Okay, but why? What's the story I want to know? Well, I went down there one time to get pressure readings because I was an STG-1 at the time and was on duty. I saw a guy standing in the corner, back facing the ladder. I asked if he was okay and he didn't reply, so I booked it. Screw that. I never went down there at night. But wasn't somebody just messing with you? It sure as hell wasn't anyone that I recognized, so you tell me. And um, that's why I stay the hell off there. I left a bit after that and figured that I'd check up on the skids anyway to see for myself. I got down there and when I touched the hatch, I felt the same weirdness from when I was a kid. And I went in anyway. Cut on the light and didn't see anything, but still felt that something was off. Everybody else that I asked said that down there is creepy, and they don't go anywhere near it unless they really have to. Those are just a few things I saw there. My old ship, USS Princeton, chased a UFO off once, off the coast of Baja, and I saw some sort of submerged disc thing on sonar once. That, and any time that we'd go over shipwrecks, I would get a weird feeling out on the smoke deck. Anyway, that's enough for now. 
I've got to get back to work. I was working night shift in a hospital that had been operating since the 1800s. It's a large manor house and is a specialist hospital for patients with brain injuries, spinal injuries and physical disabilities. It's a rather large building that has less than 30 patients at the moment due to COVID, so the entire ground floor is empty. During night shift, the nursing staff are allowed to go into one of the hospital bedrooms downstairs on break to rest. And that is what I did yesterday evening. It was around 1.30 and no one else was on the ground floor when I heard three knocks on the door in a row. I did immediately feel uneasy. The older staff tell stories about the house. It was exorcised or something 20 years ago, apparently due to strange things happening during the renovation of the hospital and was said to be unhappy spirits of a matron who had not passed on, but the paranormal activity stopped as soon as the hospital was blessed. Generally, the house is not known for a lot of spiritual activity. Maybe the odd door slamming and figure seem reported. I'm used to hearing ghost scary stories while at work in the hospital, but have never experienced anything myself. I went to investigate at the door, but nothing was there when I sat down. It happened again, three knocks in a row. And then I said to myself, if it happens again, I'm gonna go back upstairs to the ward where I was working on. It did and I got the most awful feeling of dread and returned upstairs. The other nurse just laughed, but it did freak me out. I googled three knocks in a row and was terrified, because apparently it's the three knocks of death. I wondered if anyone here knew something about it that I should know. I'm an Air Force member. At my old base, McChord Air Force Base, there is a building known as the castle, and it is the main hub for the base. I worked there for four years, and I experienced something on two occasions. The first, I had stayed up late to finish some work and emails, and I was the last one in the office. From down the hall, I heard talking that sounded like my supervisor and another airman speaking. I walked down that way on my way out to say bye, and as I turned the corner, the talking stopped and no one was there. I hightailed it out of there. The second happened at my desk. I had gone in on a weekend to work on a project, and while sitting at my desk, I heard a male's voice whisper out, Get out, into my ear. I was completely alone, and I have never been more freaked out in my life. I never worked in that office again. I used to work in a night shift call center. There were only a few other employees on night shift and the comfort rooms were empty most of the time. So I was using the toilet and I knew I was the only one there since I could see all of the other cubicles were empty. I had just stepped out of the toilet and into the hallway when I heard footsteps running in my direction from inside the comfort room. I glanced back but no one was there. From then on, I would always ask one of my co-workers to accompany me there. I was too afraid to go alone. I was stationed while in the Navy at El Centro, California. I was part of the Auxiliary Security Forces back then for a few years. One night during force protection drills, which we were required to man the base as if we were being attacked, Wearing that huge Darth Vader-like blue brain bucket, along with your best friend's sidearm M16, and other LARPing-like gear. I got lucky and stood an eight-hour watch with a friend. As we were patrolling the water treatment section of the base, we started hearing what appeared to be drums, or war drums in the distance, coming from the north. This base is in the middle of nowhere, so we chalked it up to machinery echoes at 3 a.m., right? While we were roving back south, we could hear it coming from the south, so we stopped and started to watch the south and west side of the base because it appeared to be following us. So we radioed dispatch for assistance as the drums started sounding louder and closer. A single unit showed up with a DOD civilian police officer and an actual master of arms and pointed all their SUV lights towards the area where it appeared the noise was coming from. 
We waited about 20 minutes before silence came over. Right after that, the drum beats re-emerged from the north side. We freaked out a little bit, but at this point we just went back to kicking rocks while the unit went to investigate. We started putting two and two together and just let it go. It wasn't every night you could hear it, and it was mostly random. I was a night shift CNA at a newly developed nursing home. I had worked at other nursing homes before and expected a few paranormal activities, but with this being a new building, I thought we would be good. However, this building had been built on top of the soil from an old nursing home that had been around for decades and demolished to wake way for this new facility. Everything was fine at first. For a few months we had a few residents, but as the numbers increased and different halls started to fill, things began getting spooky at night. I've always been somewhat of a magnet for spiritual things, and also my shift partner was a paranormal investigator in her spare time, so needless to say I should have expected this. Anyway, we encountered the usual little things like hearing doors slam in vacant rooms or chairs moving at the nurse's station in the middle of the night. I could handle that stuff, but our experiences started getting too close for my taste. One night I was at the nurse's desk alone at around 3am when a female voice screamed, Help me! right behind my ear. I jumped and turned, expecting to see a resident behind me, but there was no one there. An hour later, a resident down the hall, directly behind me, paged me and said there was a woman screaming for help in her room and wanted to make sure I found her. Residents' pages would also go on and off, and we would check the room only to find that they were asleep. One time, a poor resident started freaking out and said, Get me the hell out of this room, someone was shaking my bed. All of these things happened at night, and the day shift CNAs simply don't believe us. One night, I was working very late in the office with one of my co-workers. We were finishing up filing and talking before heading out. Together we went to the lobby, locking up the door, turning everything off, and went back to the mailroom to get the last few things out. While we were talking, we heard heels walking around out the lobby. It sounded like they were just walking around in circles. No one really wears heels at our office either. Thinking it was a director staying late, we quietened down and waited for them to walk by. Hello? Susan? But there was nothing. We just locked those doors, and there was no other way for them to go other than to pass us on the way out. We went to look in the lobby, and no one was there. But we both heard it as clear as day. Working late in that building always meant hearing noises and things. But that was the first time we heard something pretty undeniably strange. The following story takes place in Fort Dix, New Jersey. My aunt, grandmother, and also my mother, uncle, and grandfather, when they were all alive, all claimed there was something demonic there, especially in and around the officer housing. Apparently, a mess of officers didn't want to stay in the provided houses, and the enlisted asked if they could swap. Grandpa was enlisted and heard about this, and moved himself and his family into one of the houses. Everyone claims that even in the summer, the house wouldn't get above the low 60s. The brightest light bulbs would hardly provide much light, and the dog refused to go into the basement, and the cat litter pans would be flipped. My mother swore she would see shadow people watching her from around corners, and my aunt had one pusher while she was in the shower. My uncle had the choice to either have the entire basement to himself or the small office as his bedroom, and he picked the first option. He began sleeping in the living room after getting his feet grabbed when he would go down the basement steps. He mentioned after having a fight with Grandpa that something kept pushing its fingers into his bruises, and he woke up with more cuts and scrapes than he went to bed with. Everyone would always have some sort of scratch or bruise that they didn't remember getting. Grandma and Grandpa mentioned knowing that it was going on, but tried to continue on without acknowledging it. I worked night shift at a memory care facility that was apparently haunted, 
but it was actually one of the residents that scared me the most. The haunted aspect just added to the creepy tone of the place. We would have to do rounds to check on the residents, which was fine except for someone called Helena. She was at the point in her dementia where she was considered non-verbal. I never actually saw her in the light of day, but every time I opened the door to her room, she was sitting straight up in bed with her long, black hair completely covering her face like in the ring. If that wasn't creepy enough, the second she realized you opened her door, she would scream a bloody murder scream until you left. And in the dark, I would have to approach this person and check her briefly to make sure she was dry and clean. And being physically attacked by someone with a memory illness is not uncommon. I quit after about a month for many reasons, but that was certainly one of the contributing factors. Last year I was roughly 50 miles off the coast of New York and I saw one extremely bright light in the sky which I assumed was a light from the shore. When it dawned on me that it didn't make sense due to how far offshore was, I grabbed the binoculars for a closer look. Crazy thing was, I could not figure out if this was two miles or 20 miles away. It looked like a giant burning ball in the sky, it wasn't very high and I just knew it wasn't a plane. I thought maybe some military flare exercise, but ruled that out because it was not descending. After about five to ten minutes of trying to figure out what the damn thing was, it was gone. Just myself and one of the guy were standing there, watching on the bridge. It was around three to four a.m. We were so confused and stunned when it was just gone. It didn't burn up or slowly fade, just flat out disappeared. I'm a retail worker. My shift started at 6 a.m., which was when we usually unloaded boxes from the trucks that we received that morning or from the previous night. My job was to open up boxes and place slash organize their contents into cages that are meant to be taken and worked out on the sales floor by other employees. On this particular day, we had already received our truck the night before, so all I had to do was unpack the boxes. So here I am, 6 a.m. in the morning, all by my absolute self in the back of the store. I had just emptied out a box of stuffed elephant toys that play a lullaby tune when you wind them up. I placed them on the cage and moved them back to the next box, when all of a sudden one of the elephant toys falls to the ground behind me. I didn't think much of it at first. I just turned around and placed it back to where I had originally put it. I carried on emptying out all the contents of the box I'm working on. And just like that, I finish another two boxes as well. Again, just to reiterate, this was 6 a.m. in the morning with not a single soul around. It was still and quiet in my area. As I'm about to start unpacking my third box, I hear something that makes the hairs on my arms stand on end. The elephant lullaby starts to play on its own. And it's not just any lullaby, because that would be too normal. It's a slow, distorted, creepy lullaby sound. I knew instantly that it was the elephant toy, but I couldn't understand how it could play the lullaby on its own when nobody had wound it up, much less why it sounded so creepy. I then hear the toy fall from where I had put it again. I tell you, I have never felt more like a movie character in my entire life. I go to pick up the toy and as I'm putting it back, I check to see if the other ones make the same sound. Why would anyone want to buy their child a creepy little elephant? But to my horror, the other elephants, when wound up, make a normal lullaby sound. I first thought that the battery was dead. Even so, nobody wound up that toy, so I had no reason to start playing the lullaby on its own. To this day, I can't look at those little stuffed elephants' toys the same. Maybe there's some kind of logical explanation to it but it does not make it any less creepy in the moment. I am a Canadian Army officer. I work in a garrison that's been around for a while. It has actually been in service since before World War II. In one of the old hangars, which is now demolished, there used to be airplanes there. We had our mess, bars where we would grab a drink, and in the officer's mess, there was a Bible, a very old Bible, that no one knew exactly where it came from, but it looked old. 
everyone that has worked around that Bible has heard or seen weird stuff. It started with the following routine. Every once in a while, we would find this old Bible thrown around in a complete mess. The Bible, which was next to two other more recent ones, would be in a glass display which was in a locker. We found it super weird, but there's a civilian airport literally next to our base, so we thought maybe the vibrations or airplanes caused this. We even changed the direction of the camera to try and catch if someone was messing with the Bible, but we never saw anything. Then one day we had to do some renos, and there were these huge cylindrical paper towers, very, very heavy, and for some reason I can't quite remember, we left the three Bibles on the top of one of the cylinders. Well, the day after the cylinders were down, they were thrown and the Bibles were thrown not far from where the cylinders fell. I'm talking six foot one cylinders, and that cylinder was heavy as hell. In another occurrence, there were two female NCOs working near the stand, where the Bible was with two others on a Tuesday night shift. The floor was made of a kind of old wood slash plastic, which our boots made it very easy to know where someone was coming. So the two girls, Master Corporal and Corporal, were in different rooms. The Master Corporal was focused when she suddenly hears boots running right next to her, close to the door entrance. Of course, the light was low. The building was very old and never had great lighting. She turned super fast and asked the Corporal if it was her, that she just passed next to her. She yelled in the other room that it wasn't. No need to say that they left the building really fast. There have been a lot of occurrences like that. There's even a captain that refused to touch it and made privates move it instead. The building was demolished maybe three years ago now and we never heard back from that devilish book. I work night shift in a food factory and I used to take a break at exactly 3 a.m. and have a quick smoke as it was my routine. And after that, I decided to take a leak before heading back to work. Unfortunately, I was the only unlucky guy who decided to take a break that night, and I'm the only person in the CR. Being said, I'm in the middle of my thing, and I heard this giggle right behind me, like children playing and running around. What the hell was that? There was no one there. There should be a child here anyway, since this is a factory. I don't have the guts to check every single cubicle if someone's fooling around with me. And how that voice sends chills down my spine. And it was my only experience with ghosts. But it gave me adrenaline. Like I want to see a ghost next time. Even though it almost gave me a heart attack. And I nearly pissed my pants. My old barrack room in the Marines was a living nightmare. I have a lot of stories from it. But I want to share this first occurrence. So I was stationed on Camp Pendleton at the time and grew up near there, so I'd often go and see my parents at their house on weekends and even some weeknights. If I went home, then I'd wake up at around 4.30 to 5 in the morning then drive back to base for PT. If I got there early with time to spare, I'd take a quick nap in the barracks room. This was one of those mornings. I shared the barracks room with a roommate, but he was home on leave at the time. Anyway, I was napping in my room when I felt someone shake me awake. I sat up in bed a little confused because my very first thought was that my mum was shaking me awake at home because I'd overslept. But I was in my barrack room so I just kind of brushed it off and laid back down. I was laying on my side with my back to the wall. Shortly after I closed my eyes I felt something sit on the edge of the bed in front of my feet. I thought my brains must have been playing tricks on me. When I felt this thing get up walk around the bed and sit behind my feet. So, it's now sitting between my feet and the wall. I'm very creeped out. I'm still laying there wide awake, but eyes closed, not really reacting. The thing then starts crawling up the bed, like I'm feeling the bed indenting as their hands and knees move upwards. In my head, I'm telling myself to let it get to your head and see what happens. But it gets to my belly button, I freak out. I throw my hand over there and flip the light on, trying to rationalize it, thinking it's a cat or a rat. But of course, there's nothing. So I just take off and drive to the parking lot, where I have a nap in my car instead. I'm currently working night shift as a security guard at a factory. And one night I was chilling, doing nothing like normal. 
and at 4am a bus which can only be described as a clown bus comes driving up to the guard shack through the thick ass fog that was out that night and I was convinced I was going to die. Turns out it was a blood drive and the blood bus were just setting up early for their blood drive that was going to happen that day. But I swear, I'll never feel the same again about blood drives. I spent about six years in the Navy and had quite a few odd paranormal experiences while there. I lived in two different barracks while I was there and had friends in another building. All three of them had weird goings on. The first one was in a room shared with one other girl. My bed was against the left hand wall and on the right hand wall were the doors to the bathroom and a double set of closets with mirrors on the doors. I remember waking up more than once that night to see what I thought was the dark outline of a shadow in the mirror, sort of standing close to the bed. On other nights, I could see a shadowy figure moving in the bathroom. The second building was much nicer. I had a room to myself, but shared a joint kitchen and bathroom with the other person, though I didn't see anything in that place. She and I could both hear things moving around the other person's room when there shouldn't have been anyone there. And no, it wasn't the cockroaches, though we did find some gnarly big boys dead in the bathroom. A third building was one in which a couple of friends lived. They both did not know each other, but confided to me separately that they had eerily similar dreams of something that lived in the walls and would tap against them. Both of them claimed to have seen shadows moving around their room. So one of the buildings that I worked out of was the only remaining wing of what had been back in the day, the Naval Hospital Pearl Harbor, way back when it was first constructed. It was this huge building with two long wings, several stories high and a gnarly basement. Now it's just one dilapidated building in a parking lot. Knowing that it was a hospital in Pearl Harbor, I'm sure you can piece together the history. But let me elaborate. During the attack on Pearl Harbor, it was used as triage and as a morgue. Several hundred bodies were brought there within the first several hours alone for later identification and burial. 960 casualties to pass through on that one day. And fast forward to now, there is a 24-7 watch stood up in the building and that includes the usual staff, sitting at the desk, answering phones, going on roves, which is all well and good until it's after hours and only you and a few other people are left in the building and you're the sad little E3, E4 who has to rove alone. You'd be the only one in that specific part of the building and would hear footsteps, muffled voices and get really uncomfortable feelings of being watched. People complained about getting their hair tugged in the basement. In the hour span between two roves, I once had the shower in the basement male locker room turn on. I heard voices, disembodied coughing, the footsteps, cold spots in weird places, a horrible feeling of being watched, and after that I never used a specific drinking fountain, and I found out later that it was a problem area, and a lot of people had a similar feeling too. There was also the time that I was locked in the bathroom by a phantom. That was fun. There are also some buildings on Ford Island, which are definitely creepy. I think what makes it worse is that they are abandoned and a lot of the buildings still have damage that was never repaired. Though I have to say the spookiest thing that happened to me on Ford Island was when my dad visited. We were driving around and he insisted on stepping out of the car near the brig, you know, for the photo op. This happened to me when I was working the night shift at a nursing home. I was a registered nurse, now disabled. It was just me and a CNA, and we were the only staff in the Alzheimer's unit. She had the TV on some stupid show about hauntings in America, and then looks up at me and says, you'd think nursing homes would be haunted a lot because many people die here. I gave her a look and told her to shut up. The place is creepy enough at night as it is. We go do rounds on a resident who was in the process of passing. She was on hospice and her family was aware. 
I checked on her every 15 minutes because I didn't want her to be in pain and see if she was in any distress. At this time, she wasn't in distress, but it was obvious she wasn't going to last much longer. Her family lived across the country and had requested not to be called past 9 p.m. So I stayed with her and held her hand and read from the Bible, as she was a devout Catholic. After all the aftercare was finished, the CNA and I had to be in the room for 15 minutes, I left to call the funeral home and all of that. I barely dialed the phone number when the CNA came running down the hallway and said, She's breathing again. I don't know what to do. She was obviously freaked out and her face was pale. I went to the resident's room and she was definitely breathing now. I checked vital signs and thought everything was much lower than normal levels. But they were there. I checked them several times after she'd passed and there had been no blood pressure and no pulse, no anything. She lived for another five years and claimed that she'd met God. This is the creepiest thing to ever happen to me. I worked as a nighttime guard in an old court, which shared a back wall with an equally old arrest building. The guard room where we spent time between patrols shared a wall with the execution chamber, which is no longer in use, but one that was active within my lifetime. So yeah, old, creaky building and room with such a morbid history combined create quite a mood. Now I generally don't believe in the supernatural, but the fear is there when you have to walk around a dark, empty building like that. One night I was patrolling as usual, looking around and was a good halfway into my typical patrol route, when I noticed something in a corner of my eye. Nothing obvious, just a small shape moving behind me. I've immediately turned around, but the thing ran to a nearby corridor, not making a sound and still staying out of my direct line of sight. So I'm there frozen. I stopped in a half turn, not moving a muscle and panicking. Seconds passed, and I'm weighing my options between doing my job and looking like an idiot calling someone. Finally, I move towards the corridor, trying to move silently. I look inside, shine my flashlight, and there's nothing there, which was almost worse than if there had been something there, since the corridors are interconnected, so whatever it was could have escaped to anywhere in the building. I look around and find nothing, and eventually decide to finish my patrol. I turn around, and it's on the other side. It's the same thing. I turn my head, and it scampers into the corridor I came from. Shocked, I moved my neck again, and weirdly, I see the same movement again. Turns out it was a stain in the corner of my glasses the entire time. Our buildings were haunted. Now I say buildings and not building, because I managed to spend minimum one night in every barracks at basic training, due to a string of really unfortunate injuries that have nothing to do with this story. We heard voices during lights out. You could hear someone going up and down the central stairway. It was three stories and it would echo like hell. Upon inspection, there was nothing out there. Our stuff would also move about. One of the lads had his inspection out on an empty bed, and by morning it had all been thrown around the room. I would have suspected our corporals, but normally the damage was localized within your specific area. This was all over the room. I've got to say the weirdest one for me was when I saw a guy walking up the stairs as I was coming back from a smoke at 2 a.m. I called out to him and ran up to catch him up, and he just vanished. No doors open, nothing, just simply gone. I didn't recognize them, and they didn't have the standard number two all over haircut. So it definitely wasn't one of our lads. Who knows?